Or thank you so much for taking out the time to be with us, Sherman. Oh, absolutely. My pleasure. Happy to be here, Manash. Um, Ryan, I think that a lot of Seahawks fans would be happy about that, but what can be learned from Tom Brady's leadership skills? You talked about that on your podcast, um, on the Hogan's podcast, and I'm just wondering um, what does personality say about his um, ball throwing skills? About his ball throwing skills? <laughs> well, it certainly says that he has a, a, the dedication to to work really hard and to uh, um, to improve those and, and also maintain that consistency. I think one of the things that's um, so remarkable about him is is that you know he's fighting in the same battle that every professional athlete fights, which is against time and against old, old age, and he's been doing better at it than anyone else. Um, and, and I think it's part because of his commitment, not just on the field and through the practice, but also through his diet, through his exercise regime, all of those kinds of things um, just shows the kind of level of commitment that he has that, that uh, the other, other folks simply don't. Um, how does it actually work when you write about um, someone uh, in terms of personality that you don't have access to or you haven't applied um, Hogan's assessments on them like HDS or HPI. How do you generally go about that um, guessing? Um, I believe you have a lot of data and you know Hogan's been around for a long, long time. Um, so I believe the predictions that you make are quite correct. Have you had the chance to uh, you know cross validate your predictions about someone just like in the office or um, you know chatter or based in science? Yeah, so the, there's a couple of interesting things there. So one is that occasionally we we do get people to take our assessments who are um, pretty high profile individuals, um, and of course individuals that we know. But even individuals that we don't know, um, it, it's it, this is where I think a lot of people get confused. A lot of people think that personality is something that lives inside of our heads. It's something that's inside of our minds or inside of our bodies that, that then just comes out and, and causes us to behave in a particular way. But that's a really um, logically incoherent definition of personality and it's the intuitive one it's the one that most people go for and quite frankly many academics believe that that's what personality is about but of course there's something inside you that's driving your behavior but it's not personality what we think of when we think of personality in terms of like the big five extroversion uh, being sociable being friendly being conscientious dependable all of those kinds of things those don't exist inside of me they don't exi exist inside of you they exist inside of us in the sense that we see somebody else right we see somebody else and we go that person's dependable we see um you know tom brady behave uh work really hard and we go wow that person has a great work ethic right it, it's that personality trait exists in our minds about Tom Brady, right? It doesn't exist inside Tom Brady. Sure, there's something inside Tom Brady that makes him work really hard. But what's really critical is that those traits exist in our minds. That is, it's his reputation that exists in our heads. And so when we're talking about personality, observed personality of others, um, it, it's not as hard as it seems. You can do a personality assessment like we do, but Reputation is really the core of what personality is all about. And reputation is earned by just watching what people do, right? So you just observe their behavior. So that's the way we, we feel very comfortable about writing about other people's personality because we have seen their behavior in public display for long periods of time. And, and what more could personality be than that from our perspective? Very interesting. You certainly um, are not the kind of person who would make opinion judgments um, or you know, talk about gossips because you know you come from a scientific background. So, do you when when you see someone like Tom Brady and you talk about their leadership skills or try to rate them based on um, the HDS or HPS um, scale, do you also think that this information can be used to identify people who display the exact same talents, like uh, finding out early Tom Brady in high schools um, in college? Is that uh, has that been your experience with Hogan? Yeah, so I mean, it can be because, you know, reputation is really consistent over time. So, and there's all kinds of questions about why that is. Well, there's a bunch of reasons. Well, one is we're the same person, right? So whatever's driving us to, to do things, to think the way we think, to feel the way that we feel is sort of consistent over time. And so for, for that reason, we know we can uh, measure your reputation at time point one, and that's your best predictor of how someone's going to perform at time point two is based on how they behaved, how they felt, how they thought at a previous time point. So, so that's really what personality assessment is all about. It's about trying to measure somebody and then predict how, if they're going to, we assume that they're going to be like that later on, and there's all kinds of data that shows that they're more likely to be like that. That's your best prediction of what they're going to be like later on. And so you use that to, to make estimates of how they're going to behave. And so 
absolutely you can do this um, in that context. The only caveat, the only caution I would put against doing that is that we know there's a lot going on um, physiologically, biologically, neurologically uh, in, for example, teenagers. And there's a bunch of research showing that teenagers' behavior is really quite erratic. It's much more unpredictable than adult working adult behavior. So if you said, hey, I'm going to apply these assessments to high schoolers and use that to predict how they're going to behave in the future, you would do okay. You wouldn't do that terribly, but you would do much, much better. Your predictions would be much, much better um, if you were doing that that initial measurement was done on adults where their personalities that, that that reputation they had had already been formed because a lot of stuff is changing um from about the time of five years old all the way up through the teenage years there's um there's again a lot biologically physiologically that's changing that that does have an impact on how they behave later on um it's very interesting what you said about um the age uh, caveat there um i I've read a study where they've noticed that, you know, in, if, in high school, if they did the personality assessment, so 80% of people who turn out to be um, psychopaths could have been diagnosed as antisocial personality disorder in schools. And I was just wondering, how does Hogan actually approach that? I mean, I do understand it's a workplace assessment test, but do you have a, like a cutoff score for, you know, um, you want um, administer tests um, on population below that age um, or how does it work? Yeah, so our, our tests are designed for working adults. So we, we pretty well say you need to be above 18. For, for uh, it, it somewhat matches the US legal age for being an adult, right? So that's kind of what we match, but there's nothing really psychologically or developmentally that, that marks that, that point. That's just sort of the US definition of an adult. So we've always said like, you really need to be 18 or above. Even then I would personally, just based on our data, based on what I've seen, I would recommend reassessing. If you, if you assess at 18, I would recommend and reassessing by 22 for sure, um, 25, 29, uh, you know, up. And then what happens is when you get into your 30s, you can lengthen that reassessment out because there's still enough change going on. Like our personalities and our, and our, our, the, our behavioral tendencies still tend to change a little bit throughout that time. Once you get into your 40s, um, you can really stretch. You can, okay, if I assessed you at 40, I probably don't really need to assess you again until you're maybe 50, maybe 55, right? I can widen that gap out a lot further because people become, there's a bunch of research on this, not just done by us, showing that people become much more stable and much more consistent over time. So um, when they're younger, less predictable, you need to reassess more frequently. When you're older, much more predictable, you don't need to, to reassess as much. I, I, did, I don't know if I answered your question or not. <laughs> Oh, you did absolutely, of course. You know that was um, the question that you know um, how age plays out um, in reliability of the assessment that we actually make. One of the interesting coincidences that you know I read a paper and I didn't actually know that you were uh, behind that paper uh, in I think what was it, the Journal of Social Psychology and Personality about uh, the personality profile of supporters of Donald Trump. And I just discovered it reading your work that okay that was Sherman so. Um, I was just wondering, what were you thinking when you actually um, wrote that? Because that's kind of a wide swath of people, um, kind of a majority. I mean, we had a, such a colorful uh, four years um, in U.S. history. And I was just wondering um, what urged you to write about that or think about that? And how is it actually um, substantiated by the data that you have? Well, that, that all started when um, a few, uh, you know, so I was doing some personality psychology work at Florida Atlantic University and a few... Um, uh, reporters contacted me. Uh, I had done known some reporters from some previous work we had done, and and they contacted me and, and asked me about you know Donald Trump's personality and and those kinds of things. And I said, well, I could just you know write about it, just as we talked about when we're talking about reputation. I, he's you know really he's he's one of those people who has a reputation that's really um, easy to judge because he's in the public a lot. He's been well known for a really long time. Um, and his personality has been really consistent across his career. And so I think he's a pretty easy to judge personality. So I said, well, I'll just write you a thing up about his personality. And I put a blog post up about his personality. And I did a follow up on on his values or the kinds of things that might drive and motivate him. Um, and it was at that point that I thought, you know, um, what people want to know is because I was writing these posts and they said people really want to know, am I similar to Donald Trump or not? Because 
there's a really core idea. Again, this isn't my idea. Uh, it's the ASA principle, right? Attraction, selection, attrition, that people are attracted to um, people who are similar and organizations that are similar to them. So the idea was that people who share Donald Trump's values ought to be more likely to vote for Donald Trump. And what was really interesting about the timing of this was this was all done before he was even the nominee for the Republican Party. He had just um, won the first poll. There was one poll that showed up. There had been no polls where he was winning, but finally one poll showed up where he was leading in the Republican primary. So this wasn't even leading the presidential election. This was just a Republican primary. And uh, that's when I started doing all this work. And, and I said, well, let me just build a little survey where people can take it and they can uh, you know, put in their values and I'll just match them with what appear to be Donald Trump's values that, that he's displayed publicly. And, and then I would just ask one question, um, to what degree do you support Donald Trump as the nominee for, for, the, for president? And, um, and again, this was in comparison to other Republicans. So you can't even be like, oh, this is what Republicans are like. This is what Democrats are like. This is, this is within that same political party. People who preferred Donald Trump overwhelmingly had values profiles, personality profiles that were more similar to his. And I think this is exactly in line with that theory, with that attraction, selection, um, uh, attrition theory, right? Which is that we like people who are similar to us, particularly in terms of values. We're attracted to people who share our values, who express similar values to ours. And, and that's exactly what we saw. And so that's what kind of inspired me to do it was, you know, some reporters asked me about Donald Trump and um, one thing led to another. And I said, well, let's just, let's just let people know how similar they are and, 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 and test this theory. And, and it worked really well. And I was just wondering, have you uh, pinned down some of the aspects of personality, which are more pronounced when it comes to Donald Trump support? For example, I'm tr trying to, uh, think of a paper that I read about um, on the scale of openness versus conservatives, conservatism, people who tend to become be more conservative certainly vote for Donald Trump and he, the higher values were nationalism um, and job security and you know issues that are were very divisive, at least in the um, last election, and it turned out to be the most divisive in the history. And I was just wondering, are there some broader um, dimensions um, that were very obvious uh, in which people um, tended to behave um, in a similar way and then that uh, predicted the support for Donald Trump? Yeah, and the assessment that, that we used uh, or that I used, it was uh, the, the two of the biggest ones. One was what we called altruism, which is a little, people got a little upset about this because when we wrote about it, they were saying, well, wait a minute, are you saying that if I'm, basically people who are low on altruism um, tended to prefer Donald Trump? And they're saying, well, are you saying that, uh, you know, that I'm not nice and I'm not friendly? And it's not actually that. What we see with altruism is the people who are high on altruism tend to support um, uh, sort of like government kinds of programs like um, you know uh, government helping out the population government intervention government involvement whereas people who are low on altruism tend to be more supportive of uh, self-reliance right that's the way they tend to think about it is that you don't you don't want somebody else to help you out you should go do it yourself and so it was really that attitude that was much more reflective and then the other was commerce which is really just about interest in money interest in making money interest in being wealthy uh paying attention to financial metrics um that was another uh a value that was that was predictive of supporting donald trump do you think that economics um had a huge role to play with that you know um you know capitalistic mindset towards um versus the socialist one you know people prefer um, others over them, or um, do you think of um, themselves um, as independent individuals and government has nothing to say about their uh, money and where it's coming from and taxation? Because now um, that we're talking about um, this big um, stimulus and plan, um, certainly uh, people that is going to affect people who do not want to pay taxes, big um, corporations uh, who would want to have their own way without governmental in intervention. And to me, it seems like um, it's reflective of uh, in terms of personality of the um, predilections of people who would support uh, Donald Trump uh, versus Biden. Yeah, I mean, I think that it's, it's very true that those things map onto each other. Yeah, I mean, there, there's no doubt about that. The reason that I guess that I went for my study was it was something much more psychological. There's no doubt about from a policy standpoint, there's certain policies that people are going to go for a Republican candidate, whether it's Donald Trump or not, they're going to go for him anyway, right? Um, but uh, you know, to your question, there's some really interesting stuff here. Um, I, I actually think I could be wrong about this, but I think it's the case that most Americans don't want to pay taxes. 
regardless of their political leaning, which is kind of interesting because I think in other countries, like in Europe, um, there's much more evidence of support for paying taxes. People are much more like, oh yeah, we, you know. So most Americans really don't support tax, whether they're, regardless of, there are some for sure that do, but for regardless of political leanings, most Americans don't, aren't interested in that. And I think the, the point that gets, where it gets really interesting, it, it, it's about, and this is where I think a lot of people struggle when we talk about debt and we talk about, you know, uh, spending and those kinds of things is that the big issue it's just like, you know, with me, me and you, if, if I go to a bank and I want to get out a loan and I'm going to take out a loan to get a tattoo on my arm, well, that's probably not going to have a great return on investment, right? But if I want to take out a loan to open a business, right, the bank and the community and other people around might get some big return on that investment, right? And so, and so I think that's really the key issue. And when we're talking about these things, it's about what is the government spending money on and are those good long-term investments for um yeah uh, you know for the population yeah let's you know open up a discussion floor a little bit more so that people can think of it as science and not our tabloidish uh, personal opinion <laughs> on people um what is psychometric theory how do we um measure things that we're talking about we're talking about tom brady we're talking about economics and donald trump uh but what makes us informed scientists um and not gossip women yeah, so I mean, I think the 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 core uh, of our business and, and the core of uh, uh, what, what I know about is psychometric assessment. And so this is the, the most common form of that today is done with the self-report personality test. So where you get some series of questions and you answer those questions. Um, they, they historically were true false, but now a lot of times there's like five point rating scales from strongly disagree to strongly agree. So um, I like to go to parties. I know why stars twinkle, questions like that. And you just, um, you know, mark the degree to which you agree with, with those questions. And what we know, what, what psychometric assessment, the idea behind it is that your pattern of responses to those questions um, can be used to infer or predict future outcomes, future things that you might say, future things that you might do, future ways you might behave at work. And there is a huge literature of research, um, not just in the workplace, but showing that your responses to those questions um, predict how long you live, they predict your health, they predict whether you're overweight or underweight, um, they, they predict uh, whether you're married, whether you get divorced. I mean, they predict a whole host of factors about your life, how happy you are, um, what your career is, how far you get in your career, um, whether you go to prison or not, all kinds of things, uh, whether you use drugs, um, all of these things are related to the way, the pattern in which people respond to those questions. And so, the idea here from a psychometric ass assessment standpoint is that, that those things are repeatable. First of all, do, do people who take that assessment, do they get the same? It's, it's not random, right? They're, if they took the assessment again, would they respond in the same way? And the, the evidence is that yes, people tend to respond in the same way when given the same set of questions. And then, and then the other big question is validity. Do they predict these outcomes? And as I just mentioned, there's a huge literature showing that responses to these kinds of questions, which if you think about it, it just these questions are just really reflecting the way you tend to think, the way you tend to feel, and the way you tend to behave. And of course, that predicts um, what you're going to do in future situations. So in a lot of ways, it just really makes a lot of sense. Um, but as you said, you know, there's a big science to it. There's a right way to do it. Everybody thinks they can make a questionnaire. Everybody thinks they can make a personality assessment. But there's a lot of work that goes into actually um, building, building that assessment from a psychometric standpoint and then demonstrating that it actually predicts outcomes people care about. I think we have quite a history of um, people in psychology who try to make some sense of individual differences um, of people, um, sometimes in more fiction-like way, um, like Carl Jung when he talks about anima and um, uh, the darker side um, and things like this, and some people towards um, a little bit more, um, um, let's say, physical component, like electro complex and Oedipus complex. And now we've gotten to the point where we're using... Uh, self-report questions. And um, to quote Paul Costa when he talks about Big Five, is that these um, self-reporting questions, uh, actually the answer of that, that people use as adjectives to describe themselves or the kind of person that they want to be. And that says a lot about their personality. And I was just wondering, uh, since um, Hogan has now become a huge, um, it, it isn't a startup company that used to be it's in 180 plus countries in different languages. What are some of the reliability and validity scores in your research over the time um, for Hogan's um, tasks that 
you know, ensure that that's something that um, that must be used in scientific assessments? Yeah, so, uh, you know, typically there's reliability standards put out by, for example, um, SIOP, the, uh, the Society for Industrial Organizational Psychologists, give, give standards for, for practice. Um, then there's also independent reviewers, like so there's companies called Bureaus, the British Psychological Society. These are companies that actually employ independent people to review psychometric instruments that are used for the kinds of applied purposes that we use ours for at Hogan. And so in those reviews, you can find the, those kinds of statistics. I mean, I, I can generalize here, um, or you can also get them in our technical manuals. We report the same things in our technical manuals, and our technical manuals are available for anybody who asks. If you say, I want to see technical manual, we can just send you a PDF copy of one. Um, and so the reliabilities are what you would typically think of uh, for, for our longer, you know, our, our uh, core scales. They're in the 0.7 to 0.8 range for some of the subscales are a little bit lower, there's fewer items. Um, and the predictive validities are anywhere from, if you're looking at a single scale, the predictive validities range anywhere from about 0.10 to uh, maybe 0.3. That's uh, on the scale of an R uh, correlation coefficient. But uh, in most of our work, and, and well, actually, I'm sorry, that's not even correct. In all of our work, uh, we don't do single scale based recommendations. We don't say, okay, based on the score on this scale, this is who you should hire. This is who you should promote. This is whatever. Um, it, it's always done at a, at a profile level. And what we find there is when we go to the profile level, A, the reliabilities get even higher above 0.9. Um, when we go to the profile level, we also have validities that are much more in like the 0.5 range, right? So the predictive validity. And what does that mean? I, I'll try to translate translate that into sort of like real world terms, um, a validity of 0.5 means that imagine you had 100 people you were, um, you, you needed to hire for a job, right? There are 200 applicants and you needed to hire 100. Um, if you were doing that random, right, um, you would hire 50 people that you hired would be above average and you would have hired them and 50 people would have been below average and you would have hired them. That is, it's just random, it's 50-50. But if you use something like uh, our assessments with a validity of point, uh, a validity of R of 0 0.50, it would have been more like 75-25. So that is 75% of the people you hired would have been above average out of that group and only 25% below average. So it's a pretty significant gain, particularly when we think about ROI um, for companies, right? So what is the cost of a toxic worker? There's a bunch of research out there by other folks showing how, how costly it is when you when you hire a toxic employee. Um, and then the value of, of effective and productive employees um, is, is so, it, it, like, there's so much value in hiring the right people that it, it turns out to be, you know, millions of dollars in, in savings and, and, and actually growth for companies when, when, they, um, when they use assessments like ours. I believe you um, have recently um, remodeled your um, testing platform and you're incorporating, incorporating more machine learning and um, AI-based technology in that. Um, and that, you're right in saying that uh, Fortune 500 companies, 80% or 75% of those companies do not hire people um, without one of those personality assessment tests. Um, I recently collaborated with uh, data professors, so a famous channel um, on YouTube, Data Science, uh, and where I made a video about psychology and data science. And I um, analyzed um, the data set that I have uh, for a big five um, for this video tutorial. And I found out that if you used uh, different ensemble models um, to predict um, a certain domain, could it, it could be extroversion or um, agreeableness or narcissism. Uh, when you ensemble different models together, your accuracy goes a little bit um, up to the north. And I was just wondering if that these are some of the techniques that you have um, used in your own uh, new remodeled um, assessment platform. Yeah, so, so our new platform um, is, well, it's called the Hogan Talent Platform. One of the, the tools that we've added to that platform is called the Candidate Assessment Suite. It's the first tool we've launched on this platform. And what we did there was we went to some of our old profiles, classic Hogan profiles that were scored in a classic way, which was regression-based kind of approaches. And, you know, I really like regression based approaches, because to, I look at when I think about machine learning, it's like regression is, it's just a very particular, a very narrow area of machine learning. Because um, those old things were done with cross validation, it just wasn't done the way we do it today with with um, computer intensive kind of methods, right. So we had these old profiles, and those old profiles had historically worked really well. But what we said, when we're building, moving over to this new system, we said, you know what, we want to really open up our toolkit and say, if we were starting today, 
how would we have built those profiles? And we did the same. We, we said, okay, let's do that. And so we used uh, machine learning algorithms um, and uh, you know the, all the standard kinds of things with 80% training data. And we're, we're, we're very fortunate because we sit on um, a huge, uh, a gold mine of data, which includes personality data and job performance data. So when we built these new algorithms, we could say, okay, people in professionals jobs, people in specialist jobs, let's just put all those people that we have data on, we have personality data, we have performance data, and let's build an algorithm using machine learning methods. And we tried a whole bunch of different approaches and we ultimately settled on one approach uh, to be consistent across them, um, which gave us pretty high validities across validated uh, figures and also um, transparency, which was really important to us that that if somebody wanted to know how our model worked, how a score, uh, how somebody got their ultimate score, we could point to that. So they, they, we, we try to avoid the black box methods. We tried them. We looked at black box sorts of methods like neural networks and things like that. And they worked pretty well, maybe slightly better uh, on average in terms of validities, but we felt like that transparency was really important. So big picture though, all these new algorithms are in the system and um, we actually increased our validity substantially. So again, the old ones were working really well, then we were really proud of those. Um, but the, these new ones are just really outstanding in terms of predicting performance for particular job families. Mm -hmm. I think one of the uh, complex part of uh, working with um, psychology is that unlike data science, you don't only have to um, achieve a certain amount of accuracy, but also have to uh, explain a, lo um, a whole new phenomenon that why this accuracy is improving or is it actually real or not. And I was just wondering when you um, ran your task um, and found a correlation between job performance um, and personality types uh, and these models um, that you use um, boosted the accuracy, did you also find uh, the explain explainability of the model um, an easy process also? Because that increased accuracy would call for the reasons why um, it's uh, improving or it's just some kind of mathematics gymnastics um, that you have done to you know look good on paper <laughs> yeah so i that that was the one, one of the reasons we chose the approach we did as opposed to say like a neural network approach because then we can actually look at the out the ultimate algorithm that was that was chosen and when you do that it's just a, essentially a formula um much like a much like a regression formula, and you can you can so you can see like okay these this is how the different variables are are having an impact. Now the the problem is much like a regression formula where you have lots and lots of inputs, lots of predictive variables, um, it's hard to interpret one what one means because um, you're holding all of the other ones constant. Like that's what it means in a regression. Like the beta weights in a regression are okay if it means I'm holding all of the other beta weights constant. And that's kind of a weird thing because in personality, we know lots of personality variables are correlated. So it's kind of weird to say like, okay, um, uh, likes crowds, which is one of the subscales. All this was done at our subscale level too, by the way, um, which is one of the subscales on, on sociability on the HPI. If you say, okay, that goes, when that goes up, performance in this area is improved holding constant everything else. Well, that's a little weird because likes crowds is correlated with things like likes parties. And so it's a little weird to hold those things constant. So in some sense, the answer is yes, we got some more insight, but in other sense, it didn't necessarily totally solve that problem. So we took another approach to solving that problem, which was then to take our algorithms, score a huge number of people, in this case, our global normative sample, uh, which is the most representative data set of uh, working the working adult population in the globe, as far as I can tell. Um, and we took that sample and we said, okay, let's score everybody on that. And then let's see how would somebody, for example, who scores high on our professional's job family, how would they be perceived from a personality standpoint? So that is, how would they score on ambition? How would they score on adjustment? How would they score on sociability? How would they score on all of our scales? And we use that to help guide the interpretation. And so it's a long way of saying, yes, this did improve our, we, we actually gained some new insights from doing this, um, but in this sort of uh, long roundabout way. I think um, the prediction of job performance um, and personality scores um, certainly is one way to go about um, how to do recruitment. But how do you deal with um, enormous challenge of developing those um, people, especially if you're um, doing leadership assessments, you're talking about um, C-level executives. These are not the kind of people that if you think that they are not matching with culture, um, based on your reports, just check them out. That's now how it works. So when it comes to developing people, 
Um, do you think challenges actually improve uh, a person's character or sometimes they could become too intimidated and, you know, just throw in the towel? So I think that's something that, you know, you probably have a lot of experience also that's worth sharing. Yeah, so I mean, the, the big thing with the development is, you know, that that our assessments are sort of measuring the the core way that you think, the way that you behave, and the way that you feel. And the reality is, you're probably the next time you take the assessment, even through development training, are probably not going to change those core things. You're probably going to get very similar results, which might make people think, oh, well, that's it. People are inflexible and they're not changeable. But that's not really true. What we've actually found with our assessments is that you take our assessments and we can give you feedback, and that's what's a really important part of the process. And and I believe and we believe that everybody who takes a personality assessment deserves to get um, honest and accurate feedback about what their scores are and what those scores mean because that provides what we call strategic self-awareness. And so if we're working with these kinds of C-suite leaders and, um, you know, and they take an assessment and we say, well, you know, this is not such a great fit here or you tend um, to be too, um, too demanding of your employees or, or um, requiring things to be too perfect before they can be implemented. That's the kind of feedback that we can give them where they can actually change um, in subtle ways. In, in very particular circumstances, they can say, okay, I have to remember that this is a weakness for me um, and I need to consider that as I go into this situation. Um, and so it, it, this particularly works well if you have a coach. It also works well um, it, it, with 360 assessments where you can see a little bit more change in that kind of behavior because other people are noticing it. Um, so big picture, that's what it's re that's what it's really about. It's it's getting you some aware. A lot of people, what we find is that a lot of people are not aware of their own reputations, right? So they don't know how they're impacting other people. And by taking the assessment, they can learn how they're actually influencing and impacting others. And that's only then that you can make those adjustments, right? So as you learn something about yourself, you can go, oh, I see. That's how other people see me um, when I do that thing. So I need to do a better job of, of coming across in a different way. Um, and, and so you can, again, you pick up little tactics, little techniques, little behavioral things that you can change that are different um, in those circumstances. I, I hope that helps. Yes. I mean, and the question arises because in my personal experience um, working um, in the field such a long time, I know there's, there's a very fine line between maladaptive behavior and giftedness. And I was just listening to one of your podcasts that I absolutely dig um, with Chris Hopwood and where he talks about the fact that I am, um, when he's talking about himself, that I'm not someone who um, is good at taking orders. And luckily, I'm in the job that doesn't require me to follow orders. Then, you know, I'm kind of oppositional in character. And I was just wondering, have you also thought about incorporating some kind of feedback into your process, into your assessment that tells people, well, maybe you are a fit in another department where your weaknesses can actually be strengths. Um, and you probably don't have to push too hard in your current position and, you know, always think about your weaknesses and go through um, the whole feedback report before you interact for employees. Yeah, so, you know, as you know, our reports do, um, you know, give give pretty specific feedback about how you'll be seen and what the consequences for that are. They don't typically say like, uh, you know what, maybe there would be a better role for you or a better thing for you. Although we are actually, I can't say, I can't reveal much of the details on it, but I know we're working with a client right now who's specifically doing that. So we're building a custom solution for that client that is designed around exactly that kind of thing, um, which some people might call reskilling or realigning or whatever it is, but it's essentially taking... Uh, employees uh, in a company and um, assessing them and and then basically saying oh here's a role that actually is a better fit for you with it within the company and trying to to sort of move like basically saying look we know you're talented where you're here we like you and we want to keep you well let's try to maximize both your enjoyment of the job and um, your success on the job by getting you in, into a role that that might be a better fit um Let's take a little detour uh, from personality psychology to you. Um, growing up as a child, uh, were you an easy one to manage? Uh, were you the oppositional character? Or, I mean, uh, what would your HDS, HDS report say if I were to ask your mom? <laughs> yeah, I think I was pretty easy to manage. Um, you know, uh, I, yeah, I, I, I didn't really get into much trouble. Um, yeah, I, 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 you know, it's because you don't you didn't want big... to be, or you wanted to be seen as a good child. 
I think I, I I think I definitely wanted to be seen as the sort of like Boy Scout uh, kind of uh, individual, um, following the rules. Uh, um, you know, I I got good grades and all through high school and and, and things like that. Um, just because you know I showed up, followed the rules, did my homework. Um, you know, sort of colored inside the lines. You know, and uh, for a long time. So. Um, I mean, I, I could give specific examples, but I don't want it to sound like it's uh, <laughs> it's bragging because I don't think it's really bragging. But I mean, you know, I didn't drink into in high school at all. I didn't do any of the partying and any of that kind of thing until um, I did, did a little of that later on. But um, but I mean, I think I was a pretty easy to manage uh, uh, kid. I don't think I was too uh, too too emotional or too um, or too rule breaking. Do you also think I mean we have this um, kind of uh... folk wisdom that you know the order in which you're born um has really has to do with um how you actually turn out and elder children are generally more responsible and serious and you know i'm not sure were you the elder one or you're the only one well right so you know i almost started to answer your question by saying well i was the oldest of three kids but yeah i am the oldest uh of three although all three of us are pretty um i would say pretty responsible there's actually a bunch of research you're probably familiar with on this and um on, on birth order effects and, and and brent roberts and his group have really done a lot uh, on, on it recently um and, and basically we don't see you know the, the size of a birth order on things like cognitive ability or personality the effects are really really tiny if if they're existent at all so even though it seems intuitive one of the problems is that mentally we trick ourselves so i have two kids now and and i know it's a struggle sometimes with our younger one we have an older boy and a younger daughter and you know my wife and i sometimes feel like or the younger one stresses us out she she's so emotional she's so moody she gets upset so easily you know she, when she's tired she gets really cranky and you know it's easy to forget that the older one was kind of like that when they were at that age too you just think look at this one he's listening to our instructions and doing what we want and look at this one she's throwing a fit on the floor right and you tend to, to to compare the difference between the two but the reality is the biggest difference is that one's just older right and so we often trick ourselves into thinking that older ones are this way younger ones are this way when really uh, a lot of it's just age do you also think you know my theory that you know younger ones tend to make more um drama and you know voice out their opinions because you know they have to struggle twice as much to get your attention because there's an older um you know your blue eyed boy already in the house so you know you have to do better than that to get parents attention i i think in some ways that kind of reflect itself um in workplace also so if you see sometimes an employee um is not getting along with anyone he's just trying to you know speak out a lot you know is throwing around his weight it's probably had to do something with the, the child's experiences and you know engaged the, the engagement that they got from parents were very minimal and they're trying to make up for that do you think there's i mean now it's getting into kind of uh, um the psychotherapy and uh, brown but um do do you see the connection there well i i think that's absolutely right that that there are particularly when we think about our dark side measure the hds is we tend to think of these as sort of behavioral syndromes or even strategies for for solving short term problems right so you think about why does a kid throw a fit why does a kid cry why does a kid get emotional why does a kid get angry um usually it's it's in an effort to solve some problem there's something they want or something that they they need or uh, and they're upset about it and and they want to if i throw a fit maybe i'll get it right right that there's a, these short term strategies um but um i call them short term because they get you the goal in the short term but they tend to not really work very well in the long term and i think that's the true with a lot of the things on our dark side measure so i'll give you an example one of them is colorful and colorful is about being dramatic and attention seeking and 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 you know and a lot of times this solves a lot of short term goals right i need attention on me i need people to pay attention to me i need people to listen to what i want to say um i want to um uh move to the head of the pack i want to be seen as as important and having an impact and having those kind of colorful tendencies does that it 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 um you know Uh, getting in the spotlight it gets you that kind of attention you you're you're looking for 
And sometimes that's all it is, is that I just want attention. And doing those kinds of behaviors gets you that attention, gets you that short-term goal. But at the same time, that it often has long, what we find in our data is that it has long-term consequences. For example, um, people who are high colorful and end up being, you know, driving people crazy because they, um, you know, always have to have the attention on them. They are self-focused. They don't share credit with others. Um, they uh, uh, over-dramatize problems. And so, all of that to say that that yeah I totally agree and that I think a lot of those behaviors that you that we see as adults in the workplace are just sort of modified adapted uh, things from childhood that they've sort of said hey this always worked for me in the past right this got me the results I wanted in the past and I'm going to keep trying to do it here. I think it's very very hard to be in your position to actually you know defend um, your test and the results um, when people perform uh, badly. For example, I took uh, Mahogan's test like a couple of years ago. And one of the scores that I really remember is that I was very low on um, extra virgin. And, you know, uh, I, I probably was in the risk zone when it comes to uh, sociability. And here I am talking to people for a couple of hours, you know, about things. And I'm just wondering, is there like a qualifier when you talk about these things or that, you know, these things can manifest in many ways and that we do not perceive as possible. For example, I would be totally at uh, a loss talking to a random stranger about things because generally they're not very interested in psychometrics or psychology or neural networks and things like this. And could it be the fact that only people that who I share some topics with, um, it's easy for me to talk or how does it actually work? Yeah, so it's there was a nice book actually by Susan Cain called Quiet that talks yeah. a lot about introverts and 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 uh, I think it dispels you know it's not really scientific but I think it dispels a lot of misnomers um, about about this right so I think a lot of people think well introverts they don't talk to anybody so that's not really true introverts just actually prefer um, more low key. Um, private conversations. They also tend to prefer conversations where they get right into the topic. They don't spend a lot of time, um, you know, uh, saying, oh, how's it going? How's your mother? And, oh, isn't the weather nice, right? They don't talk about those kinds of things. They just try, they want to get into deep conversations right away and talk about with, and again, with small groups of people or even just one-on-one. -on -one. So, it's not the case that introverts don't uh, like people or, or anything like that. But to, to your bigger question of what, what do you do um, when, you know, when people take an assessment and then the results don't, don't bear out? Well, as I mentioned earlier, even in a really excellent scenario where we have a validity coefficient of 0.5, 25% of the time you'll be wrong. Right, seventy-five percent of the time you'll you'll hire an above-average person. Twenty-five percent of the time you'll have hired a, a below-average performer for that job, and um, that makes a lot of people go, "Wow, well, these things don't work. They're not accurate enough." But the reality is. Um, Companies have to make decisions. People have to make decisions, right? You have to make decisions about your romantic partners. You have to make decisions about, um, you know, your business partners. You have to make decisions all the time. And companies have to do that too. They have to decide which personnel to hire, who to recruit, um, who to who's high potential, who to put in leadership roles. And when your alter, what the question is, what's your alternative? And if your alternative is flipping a coin, well, we already know that'll be 50-50, right? So I might get the right person, I might not. Um, the idea here is that it's a probabilistic guess, right? So personality assessments are designed to be a predictor of performance and they're one of the best predictors of performance. It is not a measure of performance. In fact, we know from research that we've done, but other research that other folks have done, if you have a long track record, if somebody has a long track record of high performance and you're, gonna, you're considering them for another job, you don't really need a personality assessment for that. Like you've got a track record of performance. You already know with how, how, what this person is going to perform like. Um, that's what you should use. Um, so the reason personality assessments are useful are when you don't know, when you don't know that much about the person and also for, for self, for the individual, for, for self-development. If, if you don't, there's things you don't know about yourself that you want to work on and improve. And I think a lot of people get confused. They think, oh, you know, we've had these three people in our company for a long time and we're not sure who, to, who should be the next CEO. I know, we'll give them all the personality. So it's like, that's not, if they've been there for a long time, you already know what you're going to get with these people. And that's the information you should go on. Do you also see, you know, how it plays out? For example, you're extra first, uh, extra friends want you to go to a football game and you are hard pressed to say no, but you do say no. And then, you know, they come back and see you talking to this random stranger in your library for two hours and say, well, he doesn't probably like us, you know, and you just don't find it very easy to explain to them that they're interesting. And it's kind of a 
mutually shared conversation that you won't have on a football game. Uh, for example, link it uh, to the workplace behavior, especially now in COVID-19 time. You know, Apple just spent $5 billion on this um, open um, part that they've created. And one of the things that employees don't like about, especially the ones who are introverts, is that it's very open. So there are no shades, there are no windows, there are no cubicles, uh, and it's very transparent. And Susan Kane that you <clears throat> talked about um, further in the book that, you know, that's a nightmare for people who are introverts. You know, they need their own um, quiet space and a quiet um, moment, do you think, um, of that? And I was just wondering, do you also experience that in your experience? in your work um, with organizations and companies and, and different verticals that um, introverts are kind of, uh, you know, outwarded in a world of extroversion and, you know, they're not allowed to actually express themselves um, and heard. And uh, since they're not majority, you know, democracy is pretty against them. <laughs> well, so I, I mean, I can tell you, we have a very similar situation to Apple, right? So our building is not very old uh, in downtown Tulsa. It's a beautiful building, about five or six years old, and it's it's got a very modern feel to it. And it was built during this time when everybody was going to these open office space things. And so that's what we have is this big, giant open office space. And um, th there are certainly people who are extroverted and introverted. And a lot of people who are introverted work on my staff. Um, and <laughs> as you might imagine, with the data science team, um, and, you know, that they seem to be okay working in the environment, but I have the sense just from conversations with them that at the end of the day, they are really exhausted, that that kind of environment really, it's, it's not that introverts can't work in it or can't adapt to it. It's that it creates this extra exhaustion that when they, that when they get home at the end of the day, they just have to decompress and just, whereas extroverts, they tend to like fuel on this. They love this environment. They want to stay longer. They want to stay later. They want to go to lunch. They want to have more. So I, I totally agree with that assessment. I think that it's, um, that that kind of environment is a place where extroverts can thrive and it, it really wears introverts out. Did you talk to Robert about that? Hey, Robert, it's about time you have a coffee. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, he's actually pretty introverted. I think he seems pretty extroverted in, in, in a lot of his talks. Oh, come on. He's got his own section. office. <laughs> Uh, well, you know, he actually lives, he doesn't even live in town. <laughs> he lives, he's got his own place that he, he works from home, actually. But now we all do. So there you go. Yeah, well, um, nature turned out to be on your side. Um, <laughs> let's talk about um, such a fantastic paper that you have been uh, a reviewer on also. You know, I just only found out two days ago. Uh, and I share this all the time on my LinkedIn post uh, in conversations about um, when I'm doing advisory roles and different startups um, about behavioral assessment, uh, which is Mihai's paper on uh, Facebook likes and uh, personality development. And you wrote a very interesting blog post. So tell us about that blog post. Yeah, sure. So, um, yeah, this paper came out in about 2000, I want to say 14 ish, something like that. Okay. Um, and uh, I was a, I was a professor at Florida Atlantic University at the time. I was asked to review the paper. I reviewed the paper. I thought it was an excellent paper and, and recommended um, some changes for revision, but ultimately recommended it to be accepted. And it was accepted in, in Proceedings of the National Academy of the Sciences, which is a fantastic journal. I mean, it's really top, top of the line. Everybody wants to get papers in there. And so uh, then it was like, I don't know, a month or so later after it actually appeared, um, I, I was walking through the, the university bookstore and I heard like an NPR kind of radio come on and say, oh, a new study shows that Facebook knows uh, you, your personality better than your spouse. And I was like, wait a minute, are they going to talk <laughs> about that? And that's what they started talking about. And so I said, well, well that's not quite what the, what the study means. And so, so that inspired me to say, oh, well, let me write this blog post that sort of explains a little bit about, you know, why the study is important and why the study is really good, but also what the study means in, in terms of the consequences. And basically, uh, as you know, you know, the study showed that the things that you press like on on Facebook are related to the way you answer a self-report personality questionnaire, a typical personality questionnaire. Now, again, because most people assume that a self-report personality questionnaire is measuring something inside you, it sounds like, oh, Facebook can use those likes to figure out what the inside of you is like. But, the, but that's not quite true as, as we'll get to in a second. The other thing is, that they had is they had um, data from your friends. So your friends also rated what you're like, friends, spouses, things like that. Um, and what they showed was that using machine learning and these really cool algorithms that everybody's using nowadays, um, you can build a model just based on the information from Facebook, just based on those likes that actually predicts that self-reported personality better 
than the friends' judgments of your personality, which was like, whoa, that sounds really crazy. Facebook knows you better than your friends. The thing is that um, I don't really, well, there's a couple of things. One is that in, in table two of the supplemental materials, which um, I'm sort of proud to say that I insisted they put in there, um, <laughs> shows that actually what your friends say about you is correlated with your self-reports and what Facebook says about you is correlated with your self-reports, but there's almost no overlap between those two. Right. So they both both your friends and Facebook have different insights into what you say about yourself, which I think has really interesting consequences um, or, or just some really interesting implications. Right. Um, the other thing to keep in mind that, again, I think people get really confused by like, oh, wow, Facebook knows something about you. It's like, well, actually. If you think about liking something on Facebook as just another personality item, right? Here comes Starbucks. Do you like it or not? Here comes um, this post. Do you like it or not? If you think about those as personality items, as true, false personality items, right? If you don't like it, it's a false. If you do like it, it's a true. You could think of the uh, using Facebook as just like a constant personality assessment. And you're just telling us the things you like and the things that you don't like. And then over here, you've got this actual personality assessment that you took where you told us things that you agree with or don't agree with. And the fact that those two things are linked doesn't sound that surprising when you explain it that way, right? When you say, oh, Facebook knows you, your personality, um, that sounds kind of creepy, uh, big brother kind of like. But if, it's, if you really just realize that, wait a minute, it's, what Facebook knows is what I told it, which is the same thing that I'm telling this personality assessment, right? I'm just telling two different things, the same kind of information. You go, oh, well, yeah, yeah that just makes sense. Well, quoting Gandalf, uh, all good stories are a little embellished. Um, <laughs> like, <laughs> they deserve a little bit of uh, their own um, flavor of drama. But let's assume a word in which we wouldn't even actually need personality psychology. I mean, one thing is that you would be out of job. The other thing is that, you know, the, <laughs> if you only used, and that there's a very strong argument for this case, that if you only use behavioral data like Facebook uh, people did, likes and comments and um, sharing and things like this, and that happens to be very predictive of people's personality and what they're going to do next, because people tend not to take radically the opposite positions from the ones that they've already taken. So, for example, there's a hardcore um, Republican um, who's always voted in. Um, join the rallies and things like this. You don't see them in the first line Republican rallies. So if you only use behavioral um, psycho psychology and use the data that's been generated by the big um, companies, how do you see personality psychology, um, like big five based um, psychology that we use um, still exist? Yeah, so this is a really interesting question, and, and I've given some talks kind of around this as well. Um, and so there's a couple of things that, that come to mind for me. So the first is that um, a lot of these big data methods, which are really cool, and, and again, I follow, and, and if I've even done some work in these areas, um, what we don't really know yet is how good they do at actually predicting other outcomes. So again, we can go to Michal's uh, and his colleagues, um, that, that, that Facebook paper, there's no job performance data right, or some outcome data that we cared about it predicting. So what we actually don't know, we have, three, you could think of it as three sources of input. We have Facebook input, we have input from the self report, and we have input from the peer reports. And the question is, which of those actually predicts an outcome better? And we don't know, right? And so, and that's true for a lot of these sort of big data kinds of things where we've collected a lot of data. Well, what are the outcomes we care about predicting? There's not as many studies on that showing that those things predict these outcomes. There was just a recent study actually showing that actually peer reports, and this was a study done in China, um, showing that peer reports of your personality predict performance better than self-reports. And this to me makes total sense because this goes back to what we talked about earlier about the fact that personality doesn't live inside you, it lives inside the minds of people who watch what you do, right? And so they know what you do and they can say, yeah, this is what you're gonna do next because I've seen you do the things. Whereas we tend to lie to ourselves all the time. So even when we take a self-report, we tend to think, you know, there's, there's all kinds of stuff like this. People tend to think that they're better than average drivers. Most people do, right? Most people think they're better than average driver. That's not actually possible mathematically, right? I mean, some people have to be worse than average drivers, right? So um, th there's all those kinds of things that, that we do where we, uh, where, where we tend to overrate ourselves. And so the other people tend to have a much more, um, in my opinion, accurate perspective and a better guess about what we're going to do. So what we don't know with these methods is, is, is that kind of thing, is um, what is the actual validity? And there are some studies, but there's very few so far in knowing what they, what they can help us predict. So that's one thing that I would worry about 
for, for as, a, as a starting place, but that can be fixed, right? That can be done through, through more data, through more studies. The second thing that I worry about is manipulation of this kind of information. So imagine um, you and I start a company and, and our, what we're gonna do is we're gonna scrape LinkedIn and we are going to recommend people for jobs. You didn't even, maybe you didn't even apply, right? And it, I'm sure there's companies like this that do this now. Um, you didn't even apply for a job, but it scraped LinkedIn and said, hey, we think you would be great for this job based on your LinkedIn profile, your LinkedIn posts. Um, or even imagine a safe case where you applied for a job and you had to apply. There was a company, uh, they went out of business very quickly, but they were they were headlined in like the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal. Um, I think it was called Predictum or something like that. And it, what they were doing was helping people find babysitters, right? So if you want a babysitter and you're not sure if you can trust somebody, what you would do is have your babysitter submit their Twitter, their Instagram, and maybe one other account. And what they would do is they would scrape all that information and they would generate a personality profile of the babysitter, send it to you, and you could decide if you wanted to hire that babysitter. I think I still do that. There, sound... There's a website called Crystal Knows, and then it simply uses your LinkedIn information and gives you a personality yes. report. And I was like, what? I mean, how is that yes. possible? Yeah, Crystal Knows does that for email, right? So essentially, like it can actually help you write emails, but I don't think it actually says, should you hire this babysitter or not? But maybe no, they've changed I think changed that's, that's a total different thing. I think Crystal Knows does is that you know, it, if you give them someone's LinkedIn address, so it's going to yep. read the profile, and then it gives you the big five scores for that. And I think that's yep. not enough information to develop a LinkedIn profile. Or what do you think? Yeah, well, what's really interesting about it is, um, as the stakes get raised for that, that's where I think this gets really interesting. So in some of Mihal's early work, who we mentioned earlier, they showed, um, and this was kind of a funny story, Stephen Colbert covered it, a bunch of people talked about, that curly fries were associated with higher IQ test scores. If you liked curly fries on Facebook, you got higher IQ test scores. And what this caused was um, a bunch of people started hitting like on curly fries on Facebook. And then when they ran the models again, the association went away because now everybody went, oh, smart people like curly fries. I'm going to like curly fries. So everybody started liking curly fries, right? And it deleted the association. Now, thankfully, people weren't thinking, oh, smart people eat curly fries because then they might have been stuffing their faces full of curly fries. But, um, but the point is that my, my big picture here point is that there's a sort of this um, manipulation or faking issue that, that can come into play. And it, it, let's say our company uses Scrapes LinkedIn to, to make job recommendations. It would be very easy for me to quit. I'm going to quit our company and I'm going to start a company that helps people put LinkedIn profiles up to get jobs, right? Give me, tell, uh, and, well, here's, here's where it came up for me is again, thinking about this babysitter one. Hey, I'm sure maybe you or your listeners have heard of the, the term Finsta or Finstagram, which okay. is so, so I didn't know about this term. Somebody had to teach me about it. Um, but a lot of people have an Instagram account that's sort of a public one. And then they have like a fake one. Um, or, or maybe sometimes it's the other way around. Like they have one that their friends know about, and then they have one that well, they that's sort like of, every uh, teenager has that now. <laughs> yes, exactly. Right. And so if you were going to submit one, if you wanted to get this babysitting job, which one would you submit to the, to the program? Right. Or maybe you would even pay a company to build an Instagram profile for you that would get you that job, right? And don't and we so, have like, uh, consultants who write uh, people's Harvard application because they've already helped them and they're very it, expensive. Isn't it the same thing? It's exact same thing. It's exactly the same logic. And so that's that's one of the concerns that I think about is if, if we know, if we raise the stakes, if we say, we're gonna use these big data approaches to scrape public information, what will people do to uh, manipulate the public information so that they can they can get that lift, they can get that job. Um, and so I, that's why for me, I go, man, I really like the personality assessment because it's just you and the test questions and you get to answer them however you want. Um, and, and, and it's, it's, it's on, and everybody's getting the same questions. We don't have to worry about is somebody changing your LinkedIn profile or something like that. 
Well, hold your thought because we're going to have plenty of time to mudsling about Cambridge Analytica. So let's move on to the <laughs> third level, which is the neuroscience, which puts both behavioral scientists and you at a job. Um, and <laughs> neuroscience, uh, and I've been talking recently to one of the probably most celebrated neuroscientists, Greg Gage, um, on the podcast about uh, how good that is um, in order to in order to be able to predict uh, performance. And we also talk about uh, Elon Musk's monkey playing the video games. Um, and that didn't actually sound like it's totally done by neuroscience because there are a lot of things that you can do. Um, and you, someone come from psychology, you know probably the reinforcement um, learning, you know, the classical punishment and um, carrier thing. And that can be done through that also. So I don't exactly know this, if it's neuroscience involved in that or not, but we tend to agree that neuroscience is just not there to be able to actually um, use um, a huge amount of data from personality um, or let's say variables uh, these days and um, is able to accurately predict mass behavior. And for that, we need behavioral um, insights or the personality insights. Um, how do you see um, the future of neuroscience, if at all, in uh, personality assessments? Yeah, so I mean, I, I, I think neuroscience is a fantastic field. I think there's lots that we can learn from neuroscience and there's lots of things we're going to learn from neuroscience. Um, I'm not sure if it's what we, if it's what we want to use to predict the kinds of things that we want to predict, right? So, and just let me explain why for, for a second. So let's take neuroscience, uh, which is, I typically define the way neuroscience textbooks define it, which is, you know, study of the ner you know, the nervous system. So that would include your neurons and your nerves, uh, and including the really big bunch of neurons inside your head, which is your brain, right? So studying that and how those function. And of course, we know these are really consequential and have lots of impact for people, particularly in health uh, ways, mental health ways, those kinds of things. So so we can take that and say, okay, well, can we take take the information we can learn from that, from our nervous system, and use that to predict how somebody's going to behave, how they're going to perform on the job, how they're going to interact in this interview, how they're going to interact in this situation? And I think uh, the answer is probably not. And the reason that I think that is because all of those, we because we could even go a step further. And then that's, this is why I think that we can say, okay, well, forget about the neurons. Let's go down to the level of the atomic makeup of those neurons, right? Let's go down to that and say, oh, well, individuals might have some different number of uh, uh, protons or whatever in some of these atoms that, right, that are making them up. And that it's that, uh, that that we could use as a measure of individual differences and see if that can predict how somebody's going to behave in an interview. And I just don't think that's very realistic. I, I just think that we are... Um, that we want to, whatever level we want to make predictions on, if we want to make predictions on the behavioral level, level, it's better to stick with measurement on the behavioral level. If we want to make predictions on the neurological level, we should, you know, make, we should measure things at the neurological level. And if we want to make predictions at the uh, atomic level or even the subatomic level, then that, those are the places where we need to make those, those kind of measurements. And so for me, um, that's, that's where I kind of see, see, uh, while I think there's lots of value for neuroscience, it, it's, when we're trying to solve problems at that neurological level, um, that's where neuroscience is really valuable. When we're trying to solve problems at the behavioral level, I, I'm just, I just haven't seen much evidence that that we're going to get there very quickly, if if ever. Um, I think one of the papers, um, which kind of was a seminal paper uh, in terms of personality and IQ correlation, was by William Revell and got published in Nature also about, um, and they took um, large data sets. Um, I think IPIP was one, one of them and then Cambridge Analytica was that also, or was it open psychometrics? You don't, uh, you know, uh, take my word for that. You know, I tend to forget about those data sets. You can go and just watch the paper, uh, read the paper. And um, one of the topics was that, that, do you also see a correlation between IQ and um, certain aspects of um, your personality, certain dimensions that are overrepresented did, um, in people who tend to have high IQs. For example, we know for the fact that in openness, um, the intellect um, facet um, is very strongly correlated with um, academic performance, job performance, and IQ. Um, what, has, uh, what have some of the indicators been in um, Hogan's um, data? Yeah, so we have a similar kind of setup. Uh, we break um, our openness down into two real parts. One of them is sort of what we call inquisitiveness, which is sort of that curiosity, that exploration kind of component, that sort of um, wanting to try new things um, component. 
And then we have another dimension we call learning approach. And that one is really much more about, it's much, uh, it's much more like the, that, that IQ part of openness. Um, uh, the, the, yeah, it just, it seems to get at that. So, and we've been doing that for a long time. So it's actually kind of interesting that that separation is, is relatively recent because in the old, like what we go way back to like the 1970s HPI, it actually already had those two dimensions in there. We didn't really think of them that way at the time, but, um, but those dimensions have, have been there for a really long time. And, and if and that is the case, that learning approach predicts um, how quick, you know, th this is one of the big things that IQ test scores predict is how quickly you pick up new information. And that's what learning pr approach tends to predict is how how quickly you pick up new information, how well you can learn things from like a textbook versus um, wanting to preferring to learn things um, in a hands-on sort of approach. Um, yeah, that's the, that's the big thing that learning approach predicts, and that's that corresponds very similarly with with the results that, that you just mentioned. Um, I think a lot of academics um, and people who do research um, tend to score very high on both of your inquisitiveness and um, learning approach um, scales. Um, why didn't people um, who were involved with Cambridge Analytica think of that. And that's the time if you have a food pie, uh, food pie to throw at Mihai, you can do that. Now he's on your podcast. <laughs> and he was a deputy director of at Cambridge back then. You know, how is that possible? I didn't actually know. I, mean, I do know from the podcast that he did report that to um, the administration. But why is, does that happen? That smart people tend to ignore things um, that can be very disastrous to not only the field, but also individual people involved in that. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I think that there's a sort of a, this risk-taking behavior that's also associated, particularly with that um, inquisitive side of, of uh, openness to experience, right? So, um, you know, the, you know, in our measure, inquisitiveness, there's a sort of excitement-seeking kind of um, this, this notion to it. So that that's part of it, is that sort of like little... Um, uh, creativity and mischievousness. And we, we've actually seen this in a lot of other samples as well. So um, we have data on criminals, for example, um, particularly uh, not like petty criminals, but like um, people involved in organized crime, they actually tend to, to score pretty high on, they tend to be pretty, pretty bright individuals in some respects, right? Um, they, they tend to, to get high scores on IQ tests and that sort of thing. So um, so that's a pretty common thing. But in terms of, you know, the, the deal with, with Cambridge Analytica, it's very confusing because, you know, while Michal was working at Cambridge, the university, Cambridge Analytica had nothing to do with that. I, I didn't actually realize this until he was on our podcast and he, um, <laughs> he mentioned that they actually got a big lawsuit about that, uh, about the use of that name, which I had no idea that they were involved in that. But um, yeah, I mean, that was just a really messy situation. I felt bad for Michal because um, I had known him um, since since before then. And, and I know the head, they had been working on that, those, those uh, working with Facebook on that, that kind of data. Um, and essentially, uh, and I don't know that Michal explained it this way in his podcast, but, but it's sort of, uh, I think it's, it's pretty well known that, um, Essentially, they broke into his lab. I mean, they didn't physically break into it, right? This is all done on the cloud. They got into his his folders and uh, stole his algorithms, the algorithms that he was using to 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 make these predictions. And they said, okay, yeah, we'll just use those and we'll go sell them. And 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 um, and they, as as he has said on the podcast, they offered him a gig initially. And as he was, you know, sort of contemplating what to, what to do about this, they, they went and stole, they went and just said, yeah, we don't need you actually. We'll just cut you out and, and do it ourselves. And there's a whole um, huge debate, not only in terms of psychological data, but in general about data privacy and data security. Um, and um, there's been recent congressional hearings of fan companies about um, how they're using the data and how is it actually putting other companies out of the business and things like this. And I was just wondering, um, you probably take your um, clients very seriously at Hogan also being a huge company with data over um, decades. Um, how do you ensure some of those um, data privacy um, you know, regulations and make sure that um, personal information or demographic information that can help uh, your clients being identified uh, is secured. Yeah, so uh, a few things. I, I don't know. I don't remember all of the right terminology for this, but I mean, we have we employ an entire IT department who's pretty well. This is what their job is: is to is, is to maintain our security. So, security is, as you said, is hugely important for us. The kinds of people who take our assessments um, are, you know, are, are really well known people uh, who, who do take our assessments, and and they may not want their data leaked. Um, and we don't sell data. But we're not in that business. Um, there are other companies that do personality assessment 
any, pretty much anytime you see a free personality assessment, be a little careful, read the terms and conditions because the chances are you're not getting something for free. You're the customer uh, or, or, or yeah, I mean, you're the product rather, not the customer, you're the product and that they're going to go sell you to somebody else. So I'd be really careful in that. So that's one of the things when, when people pay for the assessments they use for us that you're getting is that privacy protection that we don't sell your data to anybody. Um, how do we do that from a technical standpoint? Well, um, I, I, yeah, like I said, I won't remember all the technical details. I think it's called SOC 2 or something. I forget what the classification is for, for the level of security. But I get uh, to give you some sense of, of the level of security we put in place. And it's, this, by the way, doesn't mean you can't get hacked. I mean, any anybody can get hacked. Really top secure companies with great IT people will get hacked sometimes. Um, but, you know, we try to put all these measures in to prevent that, that kind of loss of data that we can. Um, and just to give you some examples of who works with us, which would might be give you some idea of the level of security that's involved in, um, in our assessments, how highly secure our stuff has to be. Um, we work with the US federal government all the time on all kinds of federal government employees. Um, we also uh, work with uh, lots of financial institutions and actually they're, they have some of the most scrutiny. We do audits, internal audits constantly when we're working with financial institutions because for them that data privacy is hugely important. So, um, so that's the kind of thing that we go through as you go through internal audits, we go through external audits. Um, pretty, I, I mean, uh, maybe there's a couple of weeks, three, four weeks a year where we're not currently in an audit, but we're almost always in an audit um, for, from a security standpoint for, for those reasons. So, so it's a huge, huge important uh, topic for us and, and something that we, we care a lot about. I'm sure that's very comforting for a lot of people who have actually taken Hogan's. Um, and let's talk a little bit about uh, not what you consciously do at Hogan's, uh, but what is in the realm of possibility. Um, and I think you've talked a fair bit about um, this with uh, Chris Hopford, but I still want to talk about um, the repercussions of um, HDS, HPI, and uh, MPS reports um, in terms of clinical assessments. Um, what traditionally people have been using and recommendations of APA, uh, which are tending to become more and more worse, uh, which is MMPI, um, and that has been the industry center for uh, identifying a lot of uh, clinical assessments. And there are a huge criticisms on how these questions are framed. First of all, it's huge. It's 567 questions, um, and they're very um, abrupt. They are very um, generic. Uh, don't, no one actually knows how and what item they're actually predicting. And the report itself, it seems like a, a personality caricature, um, which is uh, pigeonholed in one um, report. For example, you can have a 6886 report. Uh, I'm sure you're familiar with a little bit about that, uh, even though you're not a clinical psychologist. But you know, it's it's kind of a generic portfolio of people who fall into a certain char um, character right characterization. And also, uh, one of the things which is very strange about that is that um, report can easily be discarded if there are questions um, enough questions that are missed. Uh, if there are questions that sound uh, cast a shadow of doubt upon if the user was paying attention or not. So there are, in general, it's quite uninterpretable. Um, and then we have dark triads that focus on, um, you know, three big um, traits. Um, and then certainly we talked earlier about Neo PIR, which is probably in the center now, at least in terms of big five um, assessment. Mm -hmm. And it gives the percentage um, of a profile that can be um, likely linked to uh, personality disorders, cluster A, B, and C. How possible is that to interpret Hogan's report and connect it with uh, personality psychopathology? Yeah, so you know, as you know, our, our assessments were not designed uh, for the purpose of, of detecting psychopathology. In fact, um, in the development, the, the, the close, like I think the one that people are most concerned about uh, in that front is called the HDS or the Hogan Development Survey, which is our dark side measure. We actually coined the term dark side um, back before people started doing work on the dark triad. Um, and I think that, you know, that a lot of people go, well, isn't that sort of a clinical assessment or how is that related to clinical assessments? In fact, we actually, the model for it, um, was this thing, uh, 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 Warren, something Warren, uh, blanking on the name, but the, the instrument was the profile, which was a um, an assessment tool that was around the DSM-3, which was the 11 personality disorders in the DSM-3, and it asked a lot of really strange um, 
deep questions that are related to those symptomologies, right? The symptomologies of, of those personality disorders. And um, we said, well, we can't do that. I mean, this is a, a measure of personality disorders. We don't want to measure personality disorders. So what we did was we took that as a model and said, yeah, but there are sorts of behavioral tendencies that everyday people have, people who don't have psychopathologies, these, these everyday tendencies that we have that get us into trouble. Um, despite the fact that, uh, you know, that, that they're not clinical, right? That you're not, you're, you, uh, you know, and so, so we built the HDS around, around that model. And um, so uh, by intentionally avoiding clinical kinds of questions, right? So uh, intentionally avoiding the kinds of things that, that would be seen as a, as a clinical assessment. So the question is, though, do, to what degree do they measure clinical uh, dimensions? And the answer to that question, we have, a, we've got a couple. One is that, um, we don't know in some sense because we don't ask people. We don't. We we don't ask people. We try to uh, going back to the point about privacy. We try to minimize the kinds of questions we ask people that might invade their privacy at all. So we don't ask people about any mental, physical, uh, health disorders or anything like that at all. The only thing we ask them are, are our set of personality questions and some basic demographic questions, so that we can make sure our assessments um, don't have adverse impact. That is, we can make sure they're treating all groups fairly. Um, so we don't ask things uh, in any kind of a clinical nature. We don't ask people about if they've ever been diagnosed with any kind of personality disorder. So in some sense, we don't really know. But in another sense, we have done some research um, with, with, with our HDS and uh, a new measure of personality disorders called the PID-5. Um, and what we've done is we've basically lined up all the scales on the HDS with all the scales on the PID-5 from a conceptual standpoint. So one of our scales in the HDS is bold. There's a PID-5 measure for narcissism. And those two conceptually are lined up because being bold is about being overly confident, um, which is similar to, to the, this pattern that you might see in narcissism. So we line those up uh, and, and we've collect data on both. Uh, and then, then there's some pretty simple tests and I, I won't go into those details, but there's some pretty straightforward tests you can see to determine if they fall on the same factor or if they're really separate factors. You can do tests for item level difficulty. Are they still really measuring the same underlying construct? And the answer is across a whole host of these, uh, we just see them as really distinct measures. Um, the HDS isn't sensitive enough. It doesn't measure sensitive enough to, to know if somebody has a personality disorder order. Um, would somebody get different scores on the HDS if they had a personality disorder versus somebody who didn't? The answer, the answer is, and in some sense, we don't know, but probably, probably they would. Um, but uh, we, but despite that, even if you got really high scores on some HDS scales or low scores on certain scales, we would not be able to diagnose you with a personality disorder. While it may be the case that some of the personality disorder gets different scores, we would not be in a position to diagnose because our measure is not sensitive to those kinds of things. Well, what if you a depersonality diagnosis or let's say personality disorder diagnosis comes as a byproduct um, of um, the data that you already have and you haven't linked into that. For example, the OPIR doesn't um, ask them if there are physical symptoms as well. It's just tells simply based mm -hmm. on big five and then, you know, it gives you a probability. For example, if I was a um, report that tells us, uh, that tells me that I'm extremely introverted, you know, extremely high on narcissism and uh, probably is very, um, um, passive when it comes to affective um, expressions and a more 90% probability is there that I can be on some spectrum of schizotypal or schizophrenia. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that can be a byproduct of the data that you already have. You probably haven't in looked into that. And then what it does is that Neo PIR gives you a check-in um, list of, you know, um, how hard or easy it is to live with this person, you know, how easy it is to work with them and things like that. And as a suggestion, I mean, if you use your existing data, why do you think um, it wouldn't be an effort worthwhile? I mean, do I do understand that, that that's not your focus area, but if you already have the data, why not? Yeah, well, I mean, we don't have the data in the sense that, you know, we just have one sample with some PID-5, right? So we don't have, we, we, we really don't have any clinical samples. I have no idea. No, you don't need clinical assessed. sample. For example, if you have the data, um, I, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the work of Thomas Whitaker, who's probably the authority mm -hmm. on this topic. Um, and, you know, there's a book um, out there, which is Big Five Personality Disorder and a coalition with mm -hmm. um, the... Um, personality disorders um, mm -hmm. with Paul McCosta. And I think uh, there's a lot of solid research in that that you can use in order to 
um, use your current data and at least predict if these people have some kind of psychopathology. And just you know, check in to them and um, ask them if they had to go to um, a psychotherapist or someone about that. And that would probably substantiate a little bit of your data. What, why do you think it's not a possibility? Well, I, we can't go to our clients. The, there's no, I, I can't go to people who took our assessments and say, hey, you took our assessments a while back for some job you were applying for or some developmental experience you were. Like that's, that, that's a violation of the terms of our, of our service. But then how do you check your reliability? I mean, if you te uh, administer tests over time, mm -hmm. I mean, you could ask them next time, you know, um, since you took the test last time, you know, there's no, been no change or... Now, I'm from the yep. offhanded question, you know, um, have you been sure. taking this file or, you know, have seeking mental assistance or something? Yeah, we, we certainly could. I mean, but uh, to, to that extent, I mean, there's a whole host of other questions we could ask just from a research kind of interest standpoint. Um, I, uh, you know, our assessments are already close to 600 items when you add HPI, HDS, and VPI together. Yeah, the most likely answer um, is no thanks. <laughs> Well, and we just try not to, to, okay. to ask any more questions than we absolutely feel like we have to. Um, I get pushed. I mean, trust me, I want to ask a lot more questions. I get pushed back all the time from our from our um, you know, commercial staff that are like, no, no more questions. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I totally get it. Um, let's talk about um, something that sets you apart uh, from others. There are situation judgment tasks, um, Rebellion, Hexaco. Uh, in the free zone, we have SAPA, um, and then um, there's Marshall Metal that's competing for your business also. And there's a lot of um, um, scientific development also, like certain complex uh, models of explaining uh, personality. And how do you think that Hogan's test racks a bit, um, against them? And what are the realistic uh, market uh, capitalization uh, figures at the moment? If you dare to share, um, share that. Yeah, well, the, the second question is a lot harder to know. It, it's it's actually quite amazing. Um, you know, when you look at revenue figures in just in the assessment business, not just Hogan's, but in the assessment, uh, how much it's grown um, to, to just in the last decade. Um, so there's clearly lots of uh, people out there. I mean, and, and you also look at um, uh, companies that are buying up assessment firms. Uh, we, we see this happening all the time. Lots of people that were sort of small family operated businesses like ours um, have been bought up, right? They're, they're, they're just, they've been bought by some bigger player. And the reason for that is because that people see that there's a lot of value in the assessments. They see that there's a, a good business model behind the assessments, um, whether even if it's even I'm talking about even assessments that aren't ours, of course. And so so that's one of the big reasons that you that you see that. So obviously, they, they think that there's a lot of market. There's a big marketplace for, for this kind of work. Um, but in terms of uh, what what you know, what makes Hogan stand out, what makes Hogan different, um, we really emphasize the science behind our assessment. So there's a ton of companies, not necessarily the ones you listed, by the way, because some of those companies do have really excellent science and excellent scientists and you know people that, that are well-respected in the field who, who work there. But there are lots of other companies that are probably less, uh, less well-known um, that don't, right? So a lot of people, anybody can make a personality test. Anybody can write items. Anybody can put a, an assessment up. Anybody can try to sell people an assessment. Um, and there's a lot of that going on. So um, relative to that, uh, relative to e even the highly psychometrically sound assessments, um, I would put our assessments up against anybody's and we have done that in the past um, from a validity standpoint. But the other thing that, that's, that I think sets us apart is um, we have a huge archive of criterion related validity studies, more than 400 at last count. Um, and a criterion related validity study for the listeners is um, where you measure personality at some time point and then you measure performance sometime down the road. And these take, a lot of time and a lot of effort. And you have to do a really good job of measuring that performance data. Most companies measure performance data and they measure it really poorly or because there's other consequences, there's political consequences tied to it, that performance data isn't very valid. And so we work really hard with our clients when we're doing these kinds of studies to make sure we've done a nice job measuring that performance data. And so we've got hundreds and hundreds of these studies. Um, as you mentioned earlier, we, you know, we've, we've got assessments. We do assessments in more than 100 countries. Uh, we're translated into uh, more than 40 languages. Um, so we have data coming from all over the world. I mentioned earlier, our global norm. Um, I'll just to give you a flavor for it. There's no, no language in our global norm, and our global norm has a, several hundred thousand people in it. There's no language in our global norm 
that is represented more than three by three percent of that sample, right? So so U.S. English only three percent of the sample in in our global norm, right? So just to give you a sense of how diverse that norm is, and the norm is is and why is it only a couple hundred thousand? Why is it not millions? Because we assess millions of people a year, and the answer is because we call it down to be representative of the global populations, right? So we make sure that that the the, the percentage of women and men in every country that's represented in our global norm. Uh, is reflective of the working population of men and women in that country. We do the same thing for age, do the same thing for ethnicity, all of those kind of factors to make it the most representative data set in the world. So those are the kinds of things that I think really set us apart is, is the science behind our norms, the science behind our validity. Um, and we can draw on that. That's what's really beautiful about having this huge archive of validity studies is that somebody can come to us and say, hey, I've got a sales job. Let's say, you know what? We've got 50 sales jobs in our validity archive. And some of them are very similar to the one you're talking about. And we can just draw on that data to make a recommended profile. Whereas if you are new, if you're starting up, uh, you don't have that, right? So you're either stuck guessing or you are, um, you're, you're having to do a criterion study, which again, as I mentioned, it really takes a lot of time and a lot of effort to build. So I think that's the big thing that makes us stand apart is our long standing um, insistence on doing good science, this huge archive of science that we can draw on um, to, to, to help our clients. Yeah, I think um, as someone who runs a free test um, and you have a sample, one of the things that we, uh, people in psychology and creators of those tests do is that, you know, we grab in our undergraduate students, throw them under the bus, and then we have a very um, academic population um, that we talk about. Um, how do you um, encounter a huge problem in psychology, which is our samples are, are weird? Um, and you can explain to people what weird sample is. Um, and then how do you actually um, make sure that um, Hogan does not suffer from this bias? Yeah, so I, weird, and I, I won't remember them all, but it's like Western, educated, industrialized, uh, democratic. Rich. I think is the rich. D, rich is the yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so, so yeah, lots and and basically what they're, what, I mean, you, to to make this simpler is what we're saying is that there's lots of studies published in academic journals that are done on U.S. undergraduates. They're done on British undergraduates. They're done on German undergraduates, uh, Italian undergraduates. You know, this is a we sort of Western countries that uh, have all those other characteristics. They're industrialized, they're rich, and, and democratic in nature. Um, and there's not so much data on these other groups. There's not so much data even on working populations. There's a huge problem in, in, in academia of, of and, and look, as a former academic, this is the stuff that I suffered from all the time. I was like, well, who do we have that can be in our study? And it's like, well, there's undergraduate students there, um, right? So you're really restricting your age range. Some of this problem they th sort of thought was being solved by the the um, by, uh, the creation of MTurk or Amazon's Mechanical Turk, where people could do these studies and these were adults living either in the U.S. or anywhere else in the world uh, who could get on Amazon's Mechanical Turk and take these surveys for, for you know, and, and what you find with that is you find that there's a much older population, right, and average age is much closer to the average age of the population, um, but there's a lot of strange things that people have found out about MTurk now um, in, in some respects. Um, like, you know, if any given year there were 100 studies published on MTurk, there's a good chance that many of those studies were just studies of the same people. So it's as if everybody's now drawing from the same undergraduate class. So you have the new right undergraduates. Now, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so there's a lot of problems. So how do we avoid that? I mean, the answer for us is that we're, we're in a really lucky position because we work with clients in real world situations. I mean, all, our data come from real working adults. And um, I will say this, I don't think the academics give us enough credit. When we try to publish papers in journals, which we do uh, you know, as often as we can, um, I, I don't think we get nearly as much credit for the samples that we actually have, that we have real adults working in real organizations, real CEOs, real executives. Um, and sometimes we'll say, well, you know, this study is nice, but it didn't include this manipulation check or it's like, but we have real people, not just yeah, that, I mean, not that undergrads aren't real people, but I mean, you know what I mean? Well, academics is a feeling industry anyways, you know, the undergraduate <laughs> enrollment is going down, you know, uh, <laughs> that might hurt the, 
<laughs> well, that's true. I mean, uh, journalism, mafia publications. For example, you sit on a lot of boards um, uh, on different journals. Can you um, honestly tell me how diverse is the population who get published? It's always the ones that have already published something or they know someone who knows someone or they're simple professor. 20% of people, people are publishing all the time. Do you really, uh, I find it really hard to believe that 80% of people around the world are like stupid enough not to be able to publish good enough paper that actually passes through the <laughs> reviewers that go there. And I have first hand experience. I'm not going to, you know, just whine a hair, but you know, at some point I gave up and said, I don't really need to publish in order to you know, do good research. And apparently my research get reads are way more than those uh, political leaders. But let's talk about uh, something else, which is um, the usage of uh, big five uh, in order to mobilize huge populations. What's your take on Jordan Peterson and his interpretation of Big Five? Uh, well, I mean, you know, he's one of the, uh, he, he has a Big Five measure that he, he built mm -hmm. with Colin DeYoung and, um, and, a, and a third co-author. Um, and so, I, I mean, I think he has a, an, an accurate conceptual understanding of the Big Five. Uh, I mean, obviously he's a very polarizing figure and uh, has, has a sort of, um, I, it's, I, I, I mean, I guess in I'm some trying respects, to say that is that do you, in your data, do you also um, can replicate from your data? His, oh, do you uh, mean that structure? Uh, what I'm trying well, to say that, you know, our gender differences as huge with effect sizes in your data as well as his, because in my data, oh. it absolutely does. You have, you have, you see big gender effects. Yes. Almost oh yeah, same ones the uh, that he's talking about about sixty five percent um, accuracy in gender identification from a random data, and then also uh, the huge differences in terms of <clears throat> neuroticism um, and extraversion, and that's mm -hmm. across all the data set. At least I have come across which are publicly available. What about yours? Yeah, yeah, we don't see that big of a gender differences in our adjustment scale, sociability scale, um, the, the, which 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 would roughly correspond to to those um, to those dimensions, but. Um, there's a couple of things to say about that. There, there, there are gender differences in personality assessment, right? So when we talk about a lack of gender differences, what we're typically talking about is the lack of, um, uh, uh, well, typically we judge it on the scale of adverse impact. That is, if you hired on the basis of this thing, would one group be disadvantaged um, by at least 20%. That's essentially what adverse impact means. And um, our, our data repeatedly shows that, no, that's just not the case, right? So we, we tend to refer to that as a small difference. So there is a small mean difference on, on adjustment, for example. Uh, men tend to score slightly higher on adjustment than women, but the difference is small enough that from a from a selection standpoint, um, it, it has no real practical impact, right? So um, knowing that if you were, uh, uh, yeah, I, I mean, it, it's better than guessing, but not much better than guessing, right? If I just have your adjustment score. Why do you think then um, there should be a gender-based quota for jobs? I'm sorry? Do you think that, you know, based on this information, there are probably no need for quotas in different jobs, you know, be it gender-based or race-based? Oh, quotas? Mm-hmm. Yeah, no. Well, so, uh, you know, my, my take is that it, it ought to be based on, oh, I mean, I'm a person on a psychologist in part because this is because I believe that this is a really uh, useful way to increase equality, um, to increase fairness. Um, and, and is that there is a measurable KPI for that? I mean, how do you uh, actually measure performance? There's no um, scientific study that at least I know of the, in which it says that you know, any gender or race or for that matter, any demographic um, can, um, if you increase a representation in a certain job from those demographics, then productivity will increase. Uh... Oh, you're saying if you if you if you if you match uh, the the productivity's in increased? Yeah, you talked about the fact that you know to improve fairness there should be quotas, right? If I understood. Right uh, no, 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 no. What I'm saying is um, to improve. Uh, yeah, I'm not saying that there should be quotas. What I'm saying is that if you want to have fairness, right, you need a fair way to evaluate your candidates, and so that's why I like personality assessments because they don't discriminate against men. They don't discriminate against ethnic minorities. They don't discriminate against older people, right? So um, the reason I like them is because you don't need quotas if you use them. Mm -hmm. um, 
because what you end up doing is hiring people who are the best fit for the job, regardless of their gender, regardless of their race, regardless of their age, regardless of all those extraneous factors that aren't relevant to job performance. So in that sense, I think I'm agreeing with what you're saying, which is that there's all a bunch of these things that um, aren't relevant to job performance, gender, all that, whether it's uh, 70% men or 70% women, it seems to have no association with how well the company performs overall. So what you want to do is, is hire people based on those characteristics that are actually related to job performance, which in, in my view is personality. Okay. And even if that might um, significantly skew the um, gender mix in a job, for example, for engineers, it's always like 12 to one ratio. And for nursing, it's also 12 to one female to male ratio. And do you also get some kind of lashback from companies? And of course, and everything has been politicized uh, um, for a couple of decades um, that um, has gone past. And I was just wondering, how do you deal that pressure as well? Well, that's a, that's a good question. And that actually has what I would call less to do with personality in terms of like big five personality assessment and much more to do with values or preferences or um, uh, what, what's the right word? Um, I guess preferences is it. Um, so uh, it's uh, th- there is a bunch of research um on on interest sorry that's the word i was trying to think of a bunch of works on on interest our values measure is is somewhat aligned to interest in, in some respects uh, we do see that women score higher on average on altruism and that effect is um is 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 bigger than what we see on um our personality assessments, right? Where on the personality assessments, we show no adverse impact. We don't use our values assessment for selection recommendations. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're not worried about adverse impact there, but we do see women score higher on altruism on average. We do see men that men score higher on commerce on average. Right. And so, um, and that aligns exactly with this, with a bunch of research not done by us on, um, on uh, job interests and um, what, what those show. And one of the big gender differences is what they, what they call person versus thing orientation. So women tend to be, um, again, on average, of course, you're going to find lots of, there's huge individual differences in this, but you're, but on average, yeah. women tend to, um, uh, be more person oriented and men tend to be more um, things uh, oriented. a thing oriented. And so, so yeah, what you do see is there's a tendency for men to prefer things like physics and engineering in the sciences. Um, whereas you see women preferring biology and psychology in the sciences, right? Whereas um, uh, that, that the, the latter two are much more about, uh, uh, about persons. Um, whereas the, the former two um, are, are more about things. And so that, that's a huge driver, right? Of, of, career interests and career pursuits. And there's data from some other folks that, that have looked at this cross-culturally, right? And said, okay, does this show up cross-culturally? And the answer is, yeah, it tends to show up cross-culturally. And the bigger, and here's what's where it gets really interesting is that there's a lot of debate about social factors. How are social factors impacting these kinds of things, societal factors? And um, what mostly the research shows is that um, in uh, sort of more egalitarian cultures, right, where people have more freedom to choose, you actually see bigger gender differences in those career preferences. Yeah. That is, people are choosing a career that they prefer more, whereas in countries where they don't have much of a choice, you, you see that less. I think the huge difference is in Sweden, where I studied and lived for quite some time. And, you know, the larger differences um, are partly um, to be caused by the egalitarian egalitarian system that they have. And instead of maximizing um, the uh, participation in certain occupation, it has maximized the differences, uh, which probably is a lot of um, hard material to uh, digest for people who were opposing for the opposite side. But let's go into something which is probably on the border of, uh, let's say, uh, from illegal to um, unethical, which is GWS, which is Genome Wide Association Studies and Units Correlation with Personality um, Psychology. There's been paper um, out there. And and some ways, you know, if you look at the uh, holistic picture of psychology, you can bring in the evolutionary psychology. And we have had a really dark past uh, when it comes to um, associating people and, and choosing the right genes. I mean, we're not Spartans, for for God's sake. I mean, <laughs> there, there's, there's need to be some um, line between uh, what research can be done and should be done. And you know, we're talking recently to, um, I think it was Okan Bullet about the fact um, that, um, uh, oh, sorry, it was um, data professor. And I was talking about the fact that um, these, uh, there's a tool called CRISPR 
um, in through which you can actually select genes um, which will be expressed when the child is born. And I'm just wondering, has there been studies in your review um, using GVAS um, and the personality um, association? And, and, and you know, there's certainly a force correlation between the genotype and phenotype on human personality and temperaments. Um, so just expand a little bit on that. Yeah, I mean, there's no doubt about that, right? So that, that, that personality has a huge, well, at, at least the way it's expressed, right? The phenotype, though, which again goes back to this conversation we had at the very beginning where, um, you know, personality is reflected in what other people see us do, right? Other people see us and they go, okay, that's what you're like. Um, we know that the, the thing that makes you do that, whatever it is you're doing is, is rooted in biology and, you know, the deep roots of biology are genetics. Um, and we, you know, we know we're more similar to people who share our genes in terms of our behavioral expression, right? There's, there's lots and lots of evidence of that. And so for sure, um, you know, personality has a big genetic component in terms of driving what we do and how we feel and how we think, and then ultimately how other people perceive us because of that. Um, and, and then there's the, uh, uh, your, to your point about, about uh, sort of gene manipulation and that kind of thing. I mean, I, uh, my personal, you know, I mean, I think there's moral and ethical philosophers who talk about these things. I mean, my personal view is that I think that's going a little too far. I think, um, you know, I, I uh, it, it gets very tricky though, because, you know, there are, uh, you know, people who are looking to have children and they use um, sperm donors and different sperm donors get different value because if they're taller or if they're stronger, and there's all kinds of things that people are looking for. Um, and that I think it's really a dangerous game in some respects, because um, one of the things and you mentioned the sort of dark history of behavioral genetics or even eugenics before that, one of the real lessons from that should have been, or I think is, um, that it doesn't even make sense because we know that a population needs diversity to, right? I mean, if there was a study that came out really recently looking at um, like uh, a monarchs of different nations and they said, how much territory did that monarch gain? How much did they grow their empire's territory while they were in charge? And they used as a predictor variable of that outcome, the degree to which they were um, essentially inbred, right? The degree to which they, they, they had a, a parent, parental lineage that had shared genes, right? And what they found was that monarchs who had less shared genes were far more successful in that endeavor, right? Basically, that monarchs who weren't very, because we know that that inbreeding is, leads to like the cognitive deficiencies and all that kind of thing, that these monarchs- You really actually were believe more, that because, you know, that's kind of a, it's very interesting, you know, I'm not from the West, um, but when I studied in Europe, so it was like, you don't get to marry your cousins because you're going to be an imbecile uh, two, three um, generations down the line. And I was just wondering, what's the scientific evidence for that? Because, you know, you could simply have those diseases even if you weren't married to your cousins. Oh, that that's true. But there is lots of, no, no, there's lots of evidence for, for, for this um, from, well, not okay, just then why animal is that, study, that, from, you know, from people who other inbred, animal studies. They still don't have that. Well, it's it's just about probability, right? It's it's the same as as a, with a personality assessment. It, it's not guaranteed in any case, but it increases then the why probability. Then why would we do that? I'm sorry. No, then why do we do that? I mean, for example, if you could have some other form of diseases by marrying someone you don't know, or just from some other family, you know, that's kind of an equal risk, isn't it? No, it's not an equal risk. That's what I'm okay. saying. Is that probabilistically, it, it's a higher risk if it's if if you have uh, children with somebody who who shares your your genetic makeup. Um, but I mean, there's just lots and lots of evidence from that from from human biology research, but also from animal biology research. Um, and so, anyway, the point is uh, that that uh, that uh, the the eugenics argument doesn't really make any sense because uh, we know we need to diversity in if we want to survive as a species. So, um, so so yeah, I, I it's kind of weird uh, actually that that was a road that that people went down. Ostensibly, really smart people, right, went down for a really long time because um, at, at the core of behavioral genetics, it doesn't make sense. Well, on the brighter side, if you could actually modify the genes, your younger one would be more manageable. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, and I mean, I think that is, you know, that is the idea. And, and I, I think that that there's kind of no stopping that at some, uh, uh, to some extent. I mean, um, oh, you're going to still mess up. That, 
that you can still mess up for sure. Uh, and and I'll, and I'll almost guarantee you that there will be mess ups. Um, because actually, you know, um, I was we don't to, know what we're doing. <laughs> yeah, talking to Shanine, actually, there was a Chinese professor who actually uh, uh, gave birth to a twin um, who he created through the CRISPR one, and then he was jailed and he was fined. Um, so I'm, I'm really thinking, you know, apart from all other things that China is doing, probably that's a promising one. But, but let's talk about some of the papers that Hogan publishes. And, you know, some of them are really, really good. Um, I have done a mindfulness meditation for such a long time, and I can see the benefits of that. And one of the papers um, by Alitsun um, et al. Um, at um, Hogan's in 2020 was about mindfulness and personality. There, it's more natural for some uh, than others and how it matters. And I'm just wondering, um, the intervention for people um, to improve um, based on their Hogan report, um, you know, it could be probably tailored based on what kind of person would be more receptive to what kind of behavior. For example, cognitive behavioral therapy is more conducive to people who are um, introverts, who can actually sit in one, one place, you know, think of uh, different possibilities of situations, um, and it might not work very good with people um, who are aggressive, have anger issues, uh, find it hard to sit down. And I'm just wondering, uh, is that some of, um, do you see some hints and inklings of that in your own data? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that that, that is uh, exactly what's hinted at uh, in this mindfulness stuff. I think that's also, that actually ties back into the previous discussion we had about, um, you know, job preferences or interests, um, that essentially, and, and also some of my colleagues that I know who do research on happiness and well-being um, and, and having children, right? So that's a big question is, does having children make you happier or less happy and that? And the answer seems to be getting what you want seems to make people happier, right? So uh, if, if you if you want to have children and you do, you're happier. If you don't want to have children, you don't, you're happier. Um, if you um, if you get the, if you get to pursue the career you want, you, you know, you're happier. If you don't, you're, you're less happy. And it's the same thing in, in this particular case is that uh, with mindfulness, it seems to be that there are certain personal personality characteristics associated with sort of receptivity towards mindfulness, enjoyment out of mindfulness, getting more benefits from mindfulness, and other people with different personalities don't seem to get as much out of it. And so it seems to me about, um, is that experience something that you want, something that you're going to enjoy? And that seems to have a, a, a bigger impact on people who, who you know, um, who, who feel more enjoyment and more engagement in it. Um, is it has a, um, I mean, does that have correlations with um, the aspect in Hogan, uh, was that HBI, about sociability or trainability, was that, um, in which people are more receptive to training or coaching? Yeah, the, there's certainly, uh, I, 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 and I, it's been too long since I looked back at that paper, that, that paper was like, We've been working on that for like three years, and it finally got published, I think, last year. Um, and and I don't remember all the details, but yeah, we use that. I think a big five mindfulness measure. There's like a five factor mindfulness measure, and then it's not big five. It's five factor mindfulness measure, and then um, correlated with our stuff. And I know there's links there, and I don't remember the specific ones. I wish I did. Some of the things that you do remember, uh, uh, probably because that's a very important question in context of personality psychology, is how ch uh, changeable are we? Is there any uh, neuroplasticity? Is there, um, you know, peaks and spikes um, in certain part of the age? I mean, we do keep hearing people from midlife, midlife crisis. I mean, crisis can come anytime. And why does it have to be in the midlife? So what does it actually change in personality um, profiles that indicates that, okay, I'm most about time to handle midlife? midlife? <laughs> yeah, so um, th there are sort of raging debates right now about personality and personality change going on in the academic literature. So um, a couple of things that we know. So for a, a long time, you know, going back to the 1980s and some work that Costa McRae had done, and uh, we know that personality is really quite stable, that it correlate but personality at a young age, even, uh, even at a very young age. I did a paper some years ago where we actually had children school children, second graders, third graders who were rated by their teachers on a bunch of personality, their, their teachers just rated them on a bunch of personality characteristics. They came back um, to, a, to a different study 40 years later. We had identified these people, invited them back 40 years later, uh, and they were in an interview, just a basic interview, getting to know you, that kind of thing. And we had people watch those videotapes and rate how they behaved in that interview, right? Just people who didn't know anything about these people, like, you know, just rated, rated how they behaved. And that those teachers' ratings of their personality 
predicted how they behaved in that interview 40 years later, which is pretty amazing, right? To tell you a little bit about the stability. So I think I read that long- paper, we, it's probably titled that, you know, teacher ratings still apply or something. Yeah, and there's a couple of other papers from that data set as well. So who knows which which exactly one it is, but teachers ratings still predict all kinds of, um, of from from a little from when you're second and third grade and fourth and fifth grade or fifth and sixth grade, something like that, predict these uh, these outcomes as adults, they predict health outcomes, they predict all kinds of things. So there's a lot of evidence for the stability of, of our personality. And again, that goes back to something we talked about earlier, which is genetics, that there's this genetic basis for how we feel, think and, and behave. And so we know that that personality is really quite stable. That's true of peers' ratings of us. Uh, that's true. You know, if people from high school know you and people from college know you and they've never met, they tend to rate you the same way, right? So there's all kinds of things about us that are really stable and that other people can see. Um, but at the same time, we also know that people develop and people mature. And there's really clear evidence that uh, we, we talked about teenagers earlier. That, that people start to increase on conscientiousness, right? I have these little kids and their conscientiousness is going up and up. They're becoming more rule following. They're becoming more prudent. They're becoming, you know, uh, more good little organizational citizens. And what we know is that when you hit teenage years, that collapses, right? That goes way down and then it stays down for a while. And then it starts to, to kind of pick back up when you hit adulthood and hit and hit real world jobs and things like that. And so um, that's a, classic developmental trend. We also know that extroversion tends to go up for most people over time and then starts to go down when people get a little older. Openness to experience has a very similar pattern, goes up and then goes down when people get older. Um, So we know that there's these sort of developmental trends. These are both from cross-sectional studies, so it's just based on age, but they're also from longitudinal studies where we've actually measured the same people over and over again, and we see that they take these same kind of patterns. So we also, so we know stability is one thing we know, but we also know change at the same time, or what I call development in this case, because I think it's sort of natural maturation kind of change. But the big question that's raging right now is about volitional change. It's about attention, intentional change. I want to change who I am. I want to change my personality. How can I do that? I want to become less neurotic. I want to become more conscientious. These are the kinds of things that people are saying in these studies. And it's really unclear to me. Now, if you read these studies, you'll find, you know, their conclusion is, oh, yes, people can change. All you have to do is send them a text message once a week or twice a week that says, remember, you want to be more conscientious, and then they'll suddenly be more conscientious. I think that's probably ridiculous. Uh, It probably doesn't work that way. But as I talked about earlier, when we talked about developing leaders, um, that having that assessment, Right. That's what we've seen in our in our data is that if you get that assessment and you get that feedback, that that's a pretty powerful intervention into motivating people, motivating people to change their behavior in certain ways. Right. To say, OK, I'm going to you know try to do this thing because I want to do this thing. One of the things that we do know from a lot of other research, including research on well-being and happiness, is you have to be motivated. Um, if you're, and that's one of the big reasons why personality doesn't change that much is a lot of people don't want to change, or or they say they want to change, but they they go, oh, not. And ultimately, I think the deal is that you can change your personality if you want to, but it's really hard. And it, it's, if you're any, if you do any kind of sports, you do any kind of athletics. Um, you know, change your your golf swing, change your tennis stroke, change your badminton swing, anything like that, any kind of thing that you've developed a habit of doing, um, it can take a lot of time, right? You might think, well, the number of hours that you've spent swinging a golf club this way, you need to put in that many hours swinging it a different way to really change it. And it's a similar kind of logic with our behavior and and, and, uh, the way we think and the way that we feel. Um, we've been doing, we've been practicing this, you know, we talked about this and we talked about sort of, um, you know, bad behavior as a child leading to, to similar kind of behaviors at all. We've been practicing these behaviors for a really long time. We've been doing these behaviors because they help us achieve the goals that we wanted to achieve, these little short-term goals. And it's really hard to just change them just like that, like to just go, oh, I'm going to be conscientious now today, or I'm going to be open to experience today. Um, what we have to do is really work on it and, and, and make a conscious effort to do that and, and to do it repeatedly and repeatedly and repeatedly. And I think with that, you can change your personality, but I think it takes I think it takes a lot of work. And I think most people, quite frankly, are, aren't going to be that motivated to do it. Um, I think from this, we can probably um, deduce um, 
the fact that if we change something around them, which is substantial, like their phenotype, well, put them in another country or put them in people that, you know, are mm -hmm. thinking the same way. For example, I remember this um, book from um, UK's national champion of ping pong. And in this book, he wrote that, you know, I'm probably not, wasn't going to become a great champion, but I did because I happened to be in the town where was UK's national champion was there and he was coach at my school. And I had a table that my buff, dad bought me on my birthday and I used to play with my brother all the time and all the things uh, put together probably incentivate um, this guy to become a champion and I was just wondering if you see people um, a certain uh, temperamental predilection if you put them together with a lot of other people for example you put criminals together um, and you know they're going to make a feast and it's called prison um, so if you put all these people together great athletes with great athletes great writers with great writers the great scientists with great scientists how hard is that to change your personality because then there will be internal motivation and right phenotype no well, and th and that's possible. I, I, and again, I don't know to what degree it would change your personality. It certainly is going to change outcomes for your life. So um, it would be a great mistake to think that personality is the determiner of out all outcomes in your life, or that um, you know your your personality is fixed and these are the outcomes that you're going to have. I mean, I talked earlier about how personality predicts you know how long you're going to live and and all kinds of health outcomes. But it's it's not it, it is not a uh, a one to one relationship, and it's not a um, a cause necessarily a causal right. It's not necessarily that your right your your uh, answer to this question doesn't cause you to to get heart disease right. Um, so it, it, there's a whole bunch of behaviors and a whole bunch of things that you can change along the way. Um, the, the, the key is, uh, and, and I think in terms of those outcomes, like for example, your ping pong uh, player, you know, there's a couple of things to keep in mind. One is that there were other people in that town too. Why didn't they become ping pong champions, right? Right, so there's also something about that person, right? So it's about both of those factors at the same time. There's something about the person that makes them unique, that has them some unique gifts, some unique talents, but also being in the right place at the right time, being in the right situation. Um, you know, the, it's when you combine those two, that's when you really see see that greatness excel or, or people get to those kind of outcomes. Um, it, it's it, it would be a mistake to think that it's entirely driven by personality and that your outcomes, your 100% are personally your responsibility. There's certainly factors in people's lives that, that, that you know, that they have no control of that, that will have an impact on, on success and failure. Then how do you see the gifted student programs in high school, even though there's a lot of criticism on that and you know, also a lot of opposition against uh, standardized tests, but there's got to be something that um, you know, ranks people um, in an order and then place them to the right place? Well, yeah, and it, this goes back to this this issue about having to make decisions, right? So we have to make decisions about people. We only have limited resources, you know. Like, look, at, at Hogan, there's a whole bunch. There's people who apply for jobs here, and a lot of them I'd like to hire all of them, but I can't. I can only hire. I can only hire one, or I can only hire two in certain circumstances, right? So, so there's there's limitations on how many resources we have, and it's a question of how do we allocate those resources the most efficiently. Um, you know, the way I like to think about personality or, or cognitive ability or any of these kinds of things is that, you know, well, partly because I used to um, play a lot of uh, um, poker uh, years ago, but I don't do that anymore. But um, is that it, it's very similar to uh, to a card game is that you're dealt a hand and, you know, the, that hand is based on genetics. Um, it's based on the, the environment that you grow up in. It's based on where you're born. All, there's all these factors. Um, and you have no say in that, right? That's from your point of view, it's completely random who you are and what you get dealt. But what's not random is then how you play that out, right? How, how do you play the cards that you've been dealt? Um, and, and those are the kinds of things that, that, um, that, that I think, uh, are, are within our control and, the, and that we can try try to act on and so so i guess that's that's the sort of the way i think about it what do i think about like things like gifted programs i mean i think that there's probably a place for those i think there's a place for for a whole host of things um the the key thing in my point of view is, is again it's about being efficient with the resources so my concern with a gifted program would be the degree to which it just um it's not a gifted program, but an elitist program, right? So how are you selected into that gifted program? Was it based on an actual fair test or was it based on how much money your parents had? And that's a real critical issue. And I know this is what's debated about SATs and ACTs and that kind of thing. But remember that Binet, the first 
you know, uh, real cognitive ability test to be, this was done in France, was the intention of that test was to find people who had lesser means, whose parents weren't rich, whose parents weren't wealthy, to find future potential leaders and innovators in France and to bring them to places where they could grow that potential, right? And so these are people who are out on farms and rural areas with no money. That was the idea behind the test, was to identify these bright individuals who would have no future because of the class they were born into and to give them an opportunity to create and innovate for the country. Um, and, and I think that that's really uh, the goal of a lot of testing, is to try to get people into places where they can be successful. I think this is a very noble um, contribution of a personality test into society. I mean, all um, civilizations that we know have who've excelled um, in their time, like Ottoman Janissaries was exactly the same method, you know, find out in a whole empire, the people who would be brilliant in certain uh, field and you know, bring them together and train them, which brings me to uh, another thing that Hogan might fall short of, uh, which is um, there's a huge campaign uh, about neurodiversity and the kind of one-off talents um, in fan companies, especially the IT companies where you're looking for people who are almost um, schizophrenic when it comes to patterns, especially in talking about machine learning and AI. You know, a lot of people that I've worked with your genius as, you know, at least in side we were creating some really nice algorithms about um, human interaction with computers. Um, and that has its downside also, but in a generic test, um, I believe HPS um, or um, HDA, these were people, the, probably they're most likely to be, um, you know, uh, flagged as outliers and probably not recommended with the status. So how do you actually, do you have any kind of, kind of controlled focus group studies or anything at all that would, you know, um, flag them as brilliant talents and not, you know, rejected material? Yeah, so that, that's a really good question. So, and in fact, this is a, is a serious issue that we've been thinking about at Hogan for almost two years now. This is something that came to my attention a while back. We got a question about to, to what degree um, are your assessments biased against um, you know, neurodiverse job candidates? And going back to some of the other things we've talked about, of course, in some sense, we don't know because we don't ask people um, it, it, it feels like, a, a well, in the United States, it would actually be illegal if the employer, the, the ultimate employer was asking this question, right? You're not allowed to ask that kind of question. So we don't ask because we don't want our employee, the people that we're, we're, we're working with to know either. So we don't actually have a sample and saying like, okay, that the, these this people as, as an autistic sample or some neurodiverse sample versus some other population to compare. Um, we are doing some research now, which we launched, again, I think we started this it was either a year and a half ago or two years ago, we, we launched a study with this group who uh, called Spectrum Fusion. They're a really great partner who uh, works with um, people who are on the autism spectrum disorder and um, tries to help them find jobs where they can be successful, right? Just, okay, well, what's a career for you? And, and there's all kinds of evidence for this, right? There's all kinds of evidence that, that, uh, that people who are neurodiverse graduate with degrees, uh, higher ed degrees at the same rates or even higher rates than people who aren't. But if you look at their job placement rates, they're way lower, right? So the questions are, what's going on there? Why are these people struggling to find jobs? And that's what this company is aimed at doing. And so we're partnering with them to say, okay, how can we help? How can we use our assessments to help this group? And so your question is, do they get different scores in the assessments? The answer is we don't really know yet. But there's, there's two other questions that are really relevant to this, which is, um, do the assessments have different implications for a neurodiverse candidate versus not? And the answer in some respects is actually no, because you know, our questions are sort of basic kinds of behavioral questions. So I, I mentioned one earlier, like do you, you know, I like to go to parties, things like that. Um, uh, you know, I tell people how I really feel, whether they like it or not, you know, I, that's, a, that's not a real question, but it's a made up one, right? Um, so people's answers to those questions whether you're on the spectrum or whether you're not on the spectrum are ir really irrelevant um, because what they predict is how you're going to behave, whether you're on the spectrum or not, right? And so we've done lots and lots of studies, again, not with this particular group, but in every other group we've studied, every other subsample we've studied, we've said, okay, 
if you get a score, for example, if you get a high score on adjustment and you're a woman, does it have the same implications if you're a man? If you get a high score on adjustment on ambition, does it have the same implications if you're a man? And the answer is yes. We find this in our reputation data. We find this in our 360 data. We find this in our performance data. That the implications are identical. That that one way to think about it is: is the regression line different? Right? Is that predicting line does it change for these different groups? And the answer is we don't see that regression line change at all. It's the same for all these groups. So the implications of our assessment seem to be the same. So this is when we get to this real um, possible, again, because we don't have the data yet, but it's a possible moral and ethical question is, imagine if you did have groups that were different. For example, imagine that uh, people who are neurodiverse scored less on one of our uh, uh, scales called interpersonal sensitivity, right? That they, that they were, were seen as less interpersonally sensitive or, or less empathic than than people who were not. Now there's a question of, and we know that the consequences are the same, right? So now there's a question of what do you do from an employer perspective? Because an employer, let's imagine employers trying to hire people in a customer service role, and they might say, well, it doesn't really matter if they're neurodiverse or not. What matters is how they express empathy. Right. And, and that's the way we would describe it, because all of the jobs, all the stuff that we do is all based on the job analysis. So they, they come to us and they say, these are the critical characteristics to succeed in this job. And if there's a group difference on that, um, it's unclear exactly what you do about there. There's legal stuff about that, but there's unclear from an ethical standpoint. What do you do if there's a group difference on something that's actually job relevant? So. I think that's a big debate that's coming, and I don't know the answer to that debate. I think, you know, basically eth ethical ethicists and, and philosophers are going to have to debate this kind of thing. But um, I do know that that's one of the things that's really of interest to us, and we are trying to work with a group to try to actually help this. And, and I think one answer to that question is, we'll try to find jobs where people can succeed regardless of uh, neurodiversity regardless of their personality profile, right? So here's, a, here's, an, a, here's an area where you can work um, based on what we know about your personality and um, irrelevant, irrespective of, of whether you're neurodiverse or not. But I think your data might be really underutilized. Um, what you could do probably is to f identify the jobs that require extreme abstract thinking and you know, then find out the um, outliers beyond the second or third deviation and then, um, you know, vet them out for their uh, experience and, you know, give them some situational judgment tasks. You can find out. So if I were to sign an NDA with you, you're going to give me your data. I can probably find something out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I, you know, I, and I think that's true. The, the, the thing is that there's sort of this um, misconception um, uh, in part, a lot of people think, oh, if you're um, on the autism spectrum, that means they're really smart at something, right? Because in part, because there's lots of evidence of this, I've seen a video of a kid Kid. It was kind of amazing. I don't remember where I saw it, but um, if you gave him a date and any time in the summer, he could tell you who did you, and he was like 12, right? So he had never seen, like in the 1970s, you could give him a game, uh, a date, and he could tell you who the New York Yankees played that day and what the score of that game was, right? And it's like, and he had, he didn't watch the game. He was, you know, but somehow he had I memorized kind all of, these. Kind of savant phenomena also where you have some kind of severe disability, but one of the things that, you know, that is probably your gift that it becomes huge. For example, there's this one guy who, if you uh, take him uh, on a chopper um, on a skyline of any city, you just come down and just paint the whole skyline, which is unbelievable. How could you actually remember that? Or if I, but what I'm trying to say is that, I mean, there's nothing to lose to look into the data and find out if there is a, a genius out there. But is it worth your time? That's probably the question you need to decide. Well, I mean, we, we certainly have lots of data and we, we could certainly point to those things. That, that I don't know to the degree to which, again, the people in our data set, um, other than this one sample that we're collecting right now, um, I don't know how they fall on, 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 on uh, sort of neur neurotypicality. But what if there is a correlation with something that's of urgent importance, which is um, how do you use personality data to predict um, the kind of uh, medical disorders that you can have. I mean, I was talking to William Revell, a couple of email exchange about the topic, and he told, pointed me towards a uh, paper that was published by, uh, what was it, um, Edinburgh's College of Epidemiology or something, and that um, related, correlated the personality uh, dimensions and the diseases that people die from. For example, if you're really high on anger and risk taking and things like this, heart attack is probably the most likely thing you're going to get. Um, and the same with um, just basically what they do is that they divide uh, medical disorders based on uh, the introversion and extroversion. So you have an extroverted um, disorder and you have introverted disorders. For example, suicide is probably 
most reserved for introverts. I mean, I don't know for the lack of a better term, but then for the extrovert, you're more likely to uh, perish in a car crash or adventure sport crash or something like else. Any signs of data in um, sense, any correlation in your data or some some research that you've done at Hogan's points towards that? Yeah, as as I mean, as as uh, Bill has pointed out to you, there is lots of data on this. Um, th these aren't outcomes that we typically measure. We do measure some in terms of like um, safety data. So we do work with a lot of clients on in in you know in dangerous uh, jobs, right? So mining, uh, oil drilling, um, truck driving, right? Places where the, there's um, safety is a serious issue, and and having accidents is seriously costly. And in that case, yeah, we actually do find um, th the trick with all of these things is that a lot of these accidents, a lot of these safety cases are really rare events. Uh, heart disease is not so rare, so it's easier to predict, but it's really, it's always difficult to predict rare events. Even if you have thousands of cases, um, you know, a company may say, well, but we just had one shipwreck, right, ever, right? And it's like, well, we got thousands of cases, but one shipwreck. So, I mean, how do you, you know, it, that, that is a challenge, but we, we, we've got enough data and enough from all of the different companies that we work with that we know that personality is associated with the kind of behaviors um, associated with being a safe versus less safe employee. And, you know, it's really interesting. Uh, we did, we, I had, I had one of our guys um, on our team do some analysis and said, well, this is really cool. All the, we went back through all of our validation studies and all of our safety studies. So how is our safety algorithm working? We did this a couple of years ago and it's still working really, really well. And I said, well, that's really cool. Wouldn't it be nice to know how many assessments we've done and all the companies we've done it with and then how many accidents we've probably saved? Again, this is all estimates, right? How many accidents have we probably saved based on using our assessment? And then um, what's the average cost of an accident, right? in that country and that's what we've done and it turns out that um it was <laughs> i came to the conclusion that we're not charging enough for our safety assessment because we have saved companies millions and millions of dollars uh in in accidents uh over the time and, and they have not paid us nearly that much one of the most difficult things as a personality company to actually establish roi was because these things are something that could have happened but did not happen right. and had they had to happen you know people right. would be more like ah okay now i know you know how much it saves <laughs> Well, uh, you know, the line is pay us now or pay later, right? I mean, you can pay us $40 for a safety assessment, or you can pay hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars when you have an accident. Yeah, but we live in a world where people would buy medicine after they have a headache instead of, you know, do some <laughs> preventative true. care. Uh, Ryan, you've been doing some really um, stressing and killing work um, at Hogan's, and that called for uh, a lot of sleepless nights, you know, thinking a lot of things. Um, how do you... Uh, plug out of your routine. Um, so let's put it that way. What who would be um, your three greatest living mus musicians or dead? Oh, musicians. Oh, uh, oh, that's interesting. Um, are you thinking of psychologists? Are, yeah, among living, I, I mean. Uh, or dead. Gosh. I can cut some slack. Okay. Well, I mean, um, I mean, Whitney Houston, pretty impressive. Uh, You're uh, old. Sing, <laughs> I am old. Singing talent, um, but I think more modern people. I, I mean, pretty much everything Lady Gaga touches seems to turn to gold. So she's pretty good. Although maybe people would even say she's old. Um, <laughs> maybe that makes me still old. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, so I think those. Um, gosh, who else? Uh, um, I'm trying to decide now that I'm limited to just one more. You don't um, listen to music much, do you? Oh no, I, I do. I listen to music all the time. Okay. That's so the actually what makes it more difficult. Kind of, okay. Is, is, is who do I who do I want to list as a favorite? Um, you know, I, I I am old, and so I do like ACDC. Although oh. I don't think they would be on anybody's top list of. No, like, I've heard that. Oh, these are the greatest musicians. Um, but I. I mean, Beyonce is really hard to keep off a list too. She's she's a real talent. Okay, I think based on uh, only these choices, I can predict pretty much HBS and HGS for you also. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you know, there is a bunch of research on, on music and, and personality preference. Uh, you're probably familiar with that as well. Yeah, so there, absolutely. There's really links between that. 
<laughs> great um ryan it's been a blast talking to you um i wish uh, we could do it forever um you know giving you more um choices about among bands and musicians and artists <laughs> <laughs> i could go on forever but thank you so much it's been such a pro prolific um discussion and uh, hopefully we're going to get you back on the podcast sometime yeah i'd love to come back this is this is a lot of fun i appreciate you having me on Minaj. Uh, thank you so much. And ask Bob, do you have some nice introverts, uh, supportive offices once the COVID-19 is over? <laughs> yeah, I think we're working on that now. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. Have a nice day. All right. Thanks. Bye-bye.